any issues before the jury comes in? No. no. All right. You can go ahead and bring them. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As you're getting your notepads out, for those of you who are taking notes, I am going to invite the uh, state to continue its examination. I'd remind the witness that you are still under oath. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Uh, when we broke for the day yesterday, we had reviewed uh, video clips as well as still photos from a file for embedded time of uh, 10 to 11 p.m. on January 26th. And in the clips that we saw, we saw two women arriving together in the same car. And you noted that at the end of that clip, uh, you observed from your watching the video uh, another car uh, coming up the driveway, right? That's correct. So with that context, let's go on to another video file. It's a file ending 120 F6. It has a beginning and embed ending embedded time and date of 11 p.m. to midnight on January 26th of 2017. We're gonna begin with exterior camera two, which is highlighted in purple. And does this video file appear to be a continuation of the last video file time-wise? In other words, does this surveillance video begin with a surveillance video from the file that we saw yesterday end? It does. You noted that at the end of the last video file, surveillance cameras record a vehicle entering the driveway. Is that arrival further seen on this clip that we're gonna see? It is. And let's play the clip now. It's embedded time of 11 p.m. on January 26th, and it lasts about 42 seconds. And you again noted that this light here appears to be motion activated based on your observation of surveillance video? That's correct. The single person who was just seen leaving the car that arrived, is he the only person seen in that car and leaving that car? That's correct. And is that same man also depicted in the other two video clips from this video file that we're gonna be watching? He is. Let's first go to exterior camera seven, uh, three, I'm sorry, and that's highlighted in red. Bless you. The car that was just seen arriving in the exterior video, about where is that car parked in this frame here? If uh, we extended the frame out to the right, you know, the car would be parked on the driveway and the individual would be walking in down the driveway and then taking a right, right by that trellis area again, going into the lighted area in the lower porch and into the uh, residence. So we'll see him in about this area that I'm indicating with the laser pointer? Correct. And let's play that clip now. It lasts only about 12 seconds.
Let's go to the last of the clips that we're going to be playing for this particular video file. It's interior camera six, which is highlighted in blue. And this clip is going to last about seven seconds. The person who drove up and entered the residence at about 11 p.m. on January 26 is States Exhibit 30K, what we're looking at, several still photos of him taken from this portion of video. Yes, it is. And the next three slides are going to be each one of these photographs individually. Does he appear to be wearing anything on his head? He does appear to be wearing a baseball hat. And from your review of surveillance footage, do you see this same man wearing a baseball hat and other footage as well? I do. Moving on to the next video file chronologically based on embedded time. It's file ending 120 F7 with a beginning and embedded time and date of 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. And now we're on January 27th of 2017. Uh, before going over the video clips and still photos on the screen as a calendar, so again, we're now on to the early morning of Friday, uh, January 27th? That's correct. The three video clips from the last video file depicted a man driving up to the house and then entering the house. Does the footage in this video file depict who appears to be the same man leaving the house and driving off in that same vehicle? It does. And is that activity depicted in the next two video clips that we're going to be playing? That's correct. So let's go to the first of the clips from this video file. It's from interior camera six, which is highlighted in blue. And this video clip has an embedded time of about 12.54 a.m. on January 27th, and this lasts about 12 seconds. We're looking now at States Exhibit 30L. Are these two photos stills taken from the portion of video that was just played? It is, they are. And we see both the male and also female circled in purple, right? Correct. Does the next series of still photographs, which is States Exhibit 30M, show that same female during that same time period in the video file? It does. Turning to the second video clip that will be played from this particular video file, from your viewing of surveillance footage, does this footage depict the same male and female that was just seen in the previous video clip from the interior camera? It does. And do we see the male and the female here with the laser pointer? That's correct. So now let's play this video clip. It lasts about a minute and 25 seconds. Again, the vehicle that the man had arrived in, that's off camera, off to the right, where the laser pointer is, right? That's correct. And from your viewing of surveillance footage, had that vehicle moved since it arrived with this man at about 11 p.m.? It had not.
and the vehicle that the man had arrived in, what exterior camera uh, viewed that vehicle? Uh, the best one would have been camera two. Highlighted in purple? That's correct. And does footage from exterior camera two depict that same man as he walked to the vehicle towards the end of the video file that we just played portions that's, of? That's correct. Showing you the remaining photos from States Exhibit 30L, are they all still photos taken from exterior camera two showing that same man? Bless you. They do. And the next four slides are each one of these four individual stills. At the end of this video file, what happens with this man in the car that he had earlier driven up in? They leave, uh, he gets in the car and the uh, car backs down the driveway and leaves. So this video file ended at about 1 a.m. embedded time. The next video file from which we're going to be viewing clips, its name ending 120F9, it has a beginning and embedded time and date of 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. on January 27th. So this is actually an hour later, right? Correct. Uh, looking at a still photo from the beginning of this video file, is this the same car that was seen on previous videos uh, yesterday as well as we just saw earlier today? Yes, it's that same station wagon. So did you review another video file with an embedded time of uh, 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. that depicts another vehicle entering the driveway, a man leaving the vehicle and entering the house at the same entrance we've seen multiple people enter, indicated by the laser pointer. Yes. Uh, sorry. Right here. Yes. And was that vehicle's arrival just before 2 a.m. embedded time on January 27th captured by external surveillance cameras, including camera two, which is highlighted in purple. Yes, it was. With respect to the vehicle that arrived at just before 2 a.m. on January 27th embedded time, is that vehicle as well as the vehicle's driver depicted in still photographs in States Exhibit 30N, which we're looking at now? It is, and if you note the uh car is now parked a little further into the driveway than it had previously been parked. So a man in a vehicle left the residence at about 1 a.m. Man in vehicle on the right arrive at the, oops, sorry. So what we saw before looking at 30 L, the man on the vehicle on the left leave the residence at about 1 a.m and the man in the vehicle on the right arrive at the residence at about 2 a.m., about an hour later? That's correct. And from your review of surveillance clips from which these two still photos was taken, as well as other surveillance footage, does it appear to be the same man in the same vehicle who left at about 1 a.m. and who returned at about 2 a.m.? It does. The next slide shows the same two surveillance stills on the left, along with phone record entries from States Exhibit 17, which the jurors saw a couple days ago, and those records were on the right. When were the three phone calls on the right made in relation to the times on the left? The three phone calls were all made in between the, uh, the, two, the two photographs. So these three calls were made in the time period between when the man left and when the man returned? That's correct. As to the photo on the bottom left here, where does the man seen walking to the left go? He goes into the residence. And is that through the same entrance that we've seen multiple people enter and leave before? That's, that's correct. So with that context, let's play the first of the two video clips from the 2 to 3 a.m. video file. And we're going to start with interior camera six, which is highlighted in blue. And this clip begins at embedded time of 2 a.m. on January 27th, and it lasts about 12 seconds.
From your viewing of the video file for this period of time, again, 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. on January 27th, does that same male that we just saw in the video appear on this camera several times during this hour-long period? He does. Looking at still photos from State's Exhibit 30O, are these still photos uh, the same man during this one-hour time period? They are. And the next three slides will be three of these photos shown individually. Let's turn to the other surveillance camera. It's interior camera seven, circled in green. So yesterday, we saw a clip from this particular camera. If you could remind the jurors why there is a crooked and partially obscured view from this camera. Uh, if the jury recalls, there was a video where um, the two females had returned, uh, apparently either from a shopping trip or somewhere where they were bringing in packages. Um, uh, the uh, shorter, blonder of the two women came out of the one of the rooms and then walked into that den area uh, up to the camera and uh, moved the camera to uh, the position that it was showing it at the time. The male seen in videos and still photos from the other interior camera that we just saw, is he also seen in this clip from camera seven as well? He is. And is he initially in the area identified by the red arrow and I'm also using the laser pointer? He is. With that, let's play this clip. It has an embedded time of 2.16 a.m. on January 27th, and it lasts about 41 seconds. Next on the screen is State's Exhibit 30P. Are these various still photos taken from interior camera 7 from the video clip that we just played? They are. And the next four slides are the four individual photos showing the male circled in red. With respect to the other still photo from State's Exhibit 30P, which is here on the left, and we're going to ask the jurors to compare the object that's obscuring the view in this still right here to an object circled in green from another photo, and it's State's Exhibit 32M, which the jurors will hear more about through another witness. And this has been enlarged below. The video file for the clips that we just reviewed had a timestamp of 10 a.m. I'm sorry, 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. on January 27th. Do the next four video files that we're going to review appear to depict the following four hours chronologically? Yes, they do. So the next several clips that we're going to be playing are from embedded times of the four-hour period from 3 a.m. to just before 7 a.m. on January 27th. Correct. And from your review of that surveillance footage, how many separate people are seen on surveillance spanning those four hours on the early morning of January 27th? Three. And what genders? One male and two females. Let's turn to the first of those sequential four-hour video files. It's a file ending 120 FA. It has an embedded date and timestamp beginning and ending at 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. on January 27th. And do portions of the surveillance video in this file depict a male and a female? They do. With respect to the male, is he depicted in the next video clip that we're going to play from interior camera number six? 
Could you repeat that? Yeah, the, the male that's seen on the video, are we going to see him in the next clip that we're going to be playing? Yes, we are. So let's play this clip. The embedded timestamp on it is 3.21 a.m. on January 27th, and this is going to last about seven seconds. So from the video just played, it does not appear that the man is wearing anything on his head for this video. From your review of surveillance footage, does it appear to be the same man seen previously in photos and videos wearing the trucker style hat that you described? It does. Does the other video clip that we're going to be played during this period depict one of the two females in the house with the man? Yes, it does. So let's play that clip. The embedded time now is 3.34 a.m., and this lasts about 37 seconds. The next hour-long video file will be file name ending 120FB. It has a beginning and embedded, uh, ending embedded date and time of 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. on January 27th. Looking to the right in this slide, how many separate video clips for this time period are going to be played? Seven. In the beginning of this video file, is there activity outside the residence that's captured by surveillance cameras? Yes, there is. And is some of that outside activity seen in the second of the next two video clips that we're going to be playing? Yes, there will be. So with that context, let's turn first to the video clip uh, to in ca uh, interior camera six, highlighted in blue. And with respect to activity outside the residence, that's going to be seen in the clip after this one. Where will that activity be generally in relative to this location? Uh, in the porch driveway area, as well as towards that garage uh, that's a barn-like structure with the two bays. And that location, again, is just outside this door right here that I'm indicating with the laser pointer? Correct. So let's play this interior footage. It has an embedded timestamp of 4.02 a.m. and it lasts about 35 seconds. And we just saw some of the skipping that we saw in videos from yesterday as well, right? That's correct. With respect to the mail just seen on the video clip just played, on the screen next is States Exhibit 30R. Are these several still photos of him taken both from the clip that was just played as well as other portions for this hour-long data file? They are. And the next several slides will show individual photos from States Exhibit 30R with their timestamps enlarged. So we have 4.04 a.m., again 4.04 a.m., 4.37 a.m., and 4.53 uh, a.m. Now let's move to exterior camera footage and let's start with exterior camera three. And for this particular footage, we're actually going to be playing this particular footage twice. And the footage begins at embedded time of 4.03 a.m. on January 27th. It lasts for about a minute and two seconds. And for the first playthrough, we asked the jurors to focus their attention on the area between the red lines in this video.
And while we're looking at this, from your viewing of the video, is anyone other than the man that we're looking that we just saw, is anyone other than him seen outside during this hour-long period? No one else. So the next slide is for the very same footage that was just played, and for this playthrough, the jurors are, are now asked to focus their attention on the area that's boxed off on the upper right-hand corner. And about where is there going to be movement in this particular area from your observation of the surveillance video? Well, in that upper right-hand corner, there will be movement in the windows area on that second floor. Uh, the areas that I'm indicating with the laser pointer? That's correct. So with that context, let's play it. And again, it's about a minute and two seconds. And we see some movement here. Mr. Johnson, I have a laser pointer. We've seen some movement. That's correct. The embedded time for the end of this particular clip is about 4.04 a.m.? That's correct. The next surveillance clip is from the same exterior camera. It's about nine minutes later. And before we play this clip, in the last clip, a person was seen walking to the left. With respect to the overhead photo, towards what area would that be where the person was seen walking from the residence to somewhere? It would be that large. Um area to the back of the property. Uh, that's the barn uh, garage area that has the two bays and a, a little bit of an extended shed uh, that's uh, on the lower uh, part of the building. And am I indicating that general area with the laser pointer? That's correct. With respect to this video clip, it begins at embedded time again of about 4.13 a.m. It runs about 41 seconds. The jurors are asked to focus attention on the boxed-in area on the upper right-hand corner again. And with that context, we'll play the video. Turn now to the third clip from the same exterior camera, and now we're moving ahead about 20 minutes. Uh, first, can a male be seen at the beginning of this video clip? I think I'm indicating him with the laser pointer. Yes. This video clip, it lasts about a minute and nine seconds. This is also going to be played twice. For the first run through, the jurors are once again asked to focus their attention on the area between the red lines.
Again, this area where the man is walking to and from, uh, what building again is this? That would be that garage barn-like structure that we talked about previously that's uh, slightly behind the main residence. <clears throat> And for the second run through, we'll ask the jurors again to focus our attention on the upper right hand corner, the boxed in area. And again, do we see some movement in this area? That's correct. So this particular clip ends at about a bedded time of 4.37 a.m. That's and correct. For the last of the clip for exterior camera three, I'm going to be moving about seven minutes later. And again, in this particular clip, is there someone already outside when this clip begins, indicated uh, by the laser pointer? Yes, that's correct. And where did this person come from? From inside the residence. This clip begins at a bedded time of about 4.43 a.m. and lasts Correct. about three minutes and 31 seconds. So this one's longer than others. From the, these exterior clips, as well as your observation of interior clips, does he now appear to be wearing that hat again? He appears to be.
Where he's walking into, is that different than the entrance that we've seen both him and other people walk in before? It is. And the room that he's walking into, that's not covered by any interior cameras that we reviewed from yesterday, right? It is not. The next slide is States Exhibit 30Q, uh, number still photos. Are these stills from the clips just played as well as from other times during this hour long period in the data file? They are. The next slide so shows some of those still photographs as well as the overhead photo that we've been referring to before. And at times in the surveillance video, the male walks not only to the left in this garage area, but also to the right off camera. And again, what's right off camera? It's the driveway area where his car is parked. And that area is indicated by uh, the laser pointer in the overhead photo, uh, photo? That's correct. And that area is covered by exterior camera two? That's also correct. Yeah, so with that, let's view the last two remaining video clips from this file from exterior camera two which is highlighted in purple. The person seen on the still in the bottom right, from your review of other surveillance footage, is this the same person seen from the previous exterior camera footage from camera three that we saw previous, uh, just now? It is. Let's play the first of two clips from exterior camera two. It begins at a bedded time, 4.46 a.m., and it lasts about 57 seconds. And let's now let's turn to the last of the video clips we'll, that will be played for this particular data file. <clears throat> Excuse me. It begins at embedded time about 4:51 a.m. on January 27th, and this lasts about 24 seconds. <clears throat> Returning to States Exhibit 30Q, three additional still photos from 30Q. Are they still photos taken from the video clips that we just played from that exterior camera? And the next slide will focus on the fo uh, photo on the bottom right, right here. There are three remaining video files. The next has a file name ending 120 FC. It has a beginning and ending embedded time and date of 5 to 6 a.m. on January 27th. 
The first of three clips that's going to be played for this video file is going to be from interior, interior camera six, highlighted in blue. This video clip begins at about 527 AM embedded time. Uh, first, for context, will this video clip and some subsequent clips show a female engaging in activity in this yellow highlighted area? It will. And again, from your observation of videos, what is in this particular area? Uh, the washer and dryer for the house. And looking at a photo that's part of State's Exhibit 32G that the jurors will hear about more through another witness, and are, is that a washer and dryer that's highlighted in yellow here that we're looking at? It is. So with that context, let's play the first of the video clips from 5 to 6 a.m. on January 27th. This one is a little longer. Again, it lasts about three minutes. And from your review of surveillance video, the woman that we're going to be seeing in this clip and other clips, is this a third female or one of the two women who had a riv uh, ride by car earlier that morning? It's one of the two women who had driven by the car. And I'm sorry, it was late, late last night. Correct. is State's Exhibit 30S. Are these various still photographs of that same female from the video clip that we just played, as well as from other portions for this particular data file? They are. Turning to the next two video clips from this file that we're going to be playing, they're both from exterior camera three, which is highlighted in red. The first of the clips begins at embedded time 5.49 a.m. And for both this clip and the next, we will focus on the red boxed in area on the upper right hand corner that we've been looking at in previous videos. Uh, for either this clip or the next from exterior camera three, is there activity documented outside below the red box 
where earlier footage depicted a man going from the left to the garage area to, and also to the right to his car? There is no activity. So the uh, only outside. activity is seen inside in this red boxed in area? Correct. So with that, let's play the clip. The, again, it's a area on the upper right hand corner and it's been enlarged for this portion of video and the jurors are act asked to focus not only on the activity but also the number of people that they can observe in this clip. And this clip lasts about 43 seconds. Moving on to the second of those two exterior clips, it begins at embedded time of 5.52 a.m. It lasts about one minute and 14 seconds. Again, it's gonna be the area in the upper right-hand corner that's gonna be enlarged. Uh, so let's go on to the next to last video file. It's file name ending 120FD. It has a beginning and an ending embedded date and time of 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. on January 27th of 2017. Uh, still from exterior cameras three is seen on the bottom right here. It has embedded time of 6.22 a.m. As embedded time gets closer to 7 a.m. on this particular data file, does the lighting change in the exterior surveillance footage? It does. There tends to be more light as uh, it reaches dawn. The vehicles that are seen parked outside the residence during this last uh, video file, or next to last video file, are they depicted on State's Exhibit 30T? They are. And are these the only two vehicles seen on surveillance cameras at the residence in this video file? They are. And at the beginning of the video file, embedded time 6 a.m., are these two vehicles seen parked as seen in these two photos? They are. At the end of the video file, about 7 a.m., are these two vehicles still at the residence in the same locations? They are. So let's focus on the vehicle and the photo on the left first, right here. This next slide is a photo on the left of the same still, along with a still photo seen earlier, and this has an embedded time of about 11 p.m. on January 26. And the next slide is going to overlap these two photos.
Does the car appear to have moved in the roughly seven and a half hours between the embedded times on those two surveillance stills? It does not appear to have moved. Going to the photo of the other vehicle, the other photo is, uh, excuse me, the photo from this particular data file is on the left. The other photo on the right is a still seen earlier. It has an embedded time of about 2 a.m. on January 27th. And again, the next slide are going to overlap these two photos. Does the car appear to have moved in the roughly four and a half hours between the embedded time in those two photos? It does not appear to have moved. So returning to exterior camera three for this video file, again, highlighted in red. It's a clip that begins at embedded time of 6.22 a.m. It lasts about 40 seconds. So we're going to ask the jurors again to focus their attention in the red boxed in area on the upper right hand corner. And the next slide should be an enlargement of that area. So we'll play it. And again, it lasts about 40 seconds. The next three video clips for this particular file, we're going to move on to interior camera six, which is highlighted in blue. The first of those clips begins at embedded time of about 6.33 a.m., and this one lasts about three minutes.
Moving on to the next clip from this same interior surveillance camera. This clip begins at embedded time of 6.39 a.m. And this la uh, clip lasts about two minutes and two seconds. The next slide has four photographs from States Exhibit 30U. Are these still photos of the female just seen in the previous two video clips? They are. And the next slide is the remaining four photos from States Exhibit 30U. Are they more photos, more still photos of that same female? They are. Judge, we have about 15 minutes left. Do you want to take the break now or continue? Uh, no, we can go for about another 15 minutes. <clears throat> So up to this point, the video files from which we've been reviewing clips have been an hour in length. What about this particular file beginning at embedded time of 6 a.m. on February 27th? Is it also a full hour in length? No, it's not. It, about how long is it? It's missing a couple of minutes. With respect to the end of the video, this still from interior camera two, which is States Exhibit 30X, is it a still shot of this particular area when this video file ends, which is, again, earlier than all other files up to this point? It is. So with that, let's turn to the last of the clips that we're going to be playing from this particular video file. It is the very end of the video file, and right before the video file ends at just before embedded time of 6.58 a.m. This last video clip begins at embedded time of 6.57 a.m. and lasts only about 11 seconds. The video is going to be replayed and the jurors are asked to focus on the man's feet and clothing, what he is wearing on his head, and what he is holding. Again, it's only about seven seconds. Does the video file end seconds after this? It does. And is anyone else seen other than this male on the video just before it ends? There is no one. The male seen immediately before the video ends, just before 6.58 on January 27th, is States Exhibit 30W, various still photos of him. They are. And the next three slides are three of the individual photos from States Exhibit 30W.
So we've reviewed on this next to last video file, video and photos from three of the six cameras, exterior cameras two and three, and interior camera six. Do the three photos at the top here from States Exhibit 30V, do they depict what is seen on the remaining three cameras during uh, this period on the video file from 6 a.m. to about 7 a.m.? They do. And going from left to right in the photos, from what cameras are the still shots taken? So this photo on the left is from which surveillance? photo on the left is from camera one, which covered the uh, lower part of the driveway. And the middle surveillance photo? Middle pan, uh, picture is from camera seven, which is an interior camera that had covered that den area that we talked about previously. And the photo on the far right? Far right is camera five. And that's below the porch that you described before? That's correct. So let's go to the last video file. It's a file name ending 120 FE. <clears throat> it has a beginning embedded date and time of 9 a.m. on January 27th of 2017. But again, do you know whether the embedded time and date stamps on these video files are accurate? I do not. Does States Exhibit 30Y, what we're looking at right now, depict the areas shown by surveillance cameras for this particular video file? They do. For all the other video files which we have reviewed footage for up to this point, how many cameras had video footage? Six. Is that the same with the last video file footage from six cameras? No, it's not. From what camera is there no footage in this particular file? We're no longer getting any video from camera three. And that's the one that's X'd out in the overhead now? Correct. I want to focus on the two cameras indicated by the red arrows, interior camera six, which was been highlighted in blue, and also exterior camera five, which we actually haven't seen up to this point. Does States Exhibit 37 show what those two cameras depict in the last video file compared to what was shown in the previously viewed video file that ended at embedded time 6.57 a.m. with some differences between the two highlighted? They do. So let's take a closer look at the still photos from interior camera six, which are the photos on the left. So the still on the left is from the last video file that ended at about 6.58 a.m.? Correct. And the photo on the right is from the last video file that we're reviewing right now? That's correct. And uh, how many different areas or objects are circled in each of the photos? Three. So we have, appears to be an object circled here that's not indicated here. We also have an area circled here and here for comparison. And lastly, we have an area here and here for comparison? Correct. Let's go on to exterior camera five. The still on the left here is from the last video file that ended at about 6.58 a.m.? Correct. And the photo on the right is from the video file that we, we are reviewing right now? That's correct. And we have two circled areas in each photo? Yes. So we have a circled area on the left here and towards the middle of the photograph. Let's go to the last video clip that we're going to be playing. It's from interior camera six and it's highlighted in blue. And is this clip going to show a male in the room? It is. And does the clip also appear to capture part of a second person wearing different clothes in this area off to the right? It, it will. And now let's play this last clip. It lasts about a minute and 25 seconds.
So where he's going to, that object right there, that was not seen on the surveillance footage that ended at about 6.58 a.m., right? It, it would not. What does that appear to be to you? Excuse me? What does that object appear to be to you? A uh, smaller size propane tank. And does that appear to be somebody else wearing different clothing? It does. <coughs> We're now on States Exhibit 30Z. Are these various still photographs from this last video clip that we played? They are. And with respect to uh, the second person with apparently wearing different clothes, we see that in this photograph on the bottom right. It is. On the video, is that about the most that can be seen of that second person? Pretty much. And does any of the video from this video file show anyone either arriving at the house or entering the house? It does not. So focusing on the male scene in this room, the top two photos here. The next slide are the same two photos on the left? Yes. And on the right are portions of still photos the jurors saw uh, much earlier in your testimony from States Exhibit 30C? Is that correct? And again, focusing on the still photos on the left from the video clip just played. Moving on to the last slide, are those still uh, two still photos also seen in States Exhibit 35 in the middle? They are. <clears throat> One moment. I have no further questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take our morning recess now, and let's try to return at about 11.30, and then we'll work until 12.15. Okay? Thank you. <clears throat>
Uh, cross examination. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Just going to ask you uh, some questions about photos that um, were shown. Um, if you could have uh, Exhibit 30C. In the upper part of the photo, is that um, a depiction of a man with a plaid shirt or a jacket? Which, which picture are we looking at? In the upper part of the photo. So I would say there's two photos on the top. Yep. Is that a depiction of a person wearing a plaid shirt or jacket? Yes, it is. We can go to... And, and just so that we, the jury knows the date, and this is uh, that date, the embedded date is January 25, 2017, at about 318 in the morning? Correct. We can go to uh, Exhibit 30D. In the lower right hand corner, I think you earlier identified a person standing at the uh, entry to, at the um, entryway into the other room. Is that accurate? This is second person. That's correct. Or what appears to be second person. Okay, so that person is also wearing a plaid jacket. It appears to be plaid. I couldn't tell right from that photo, but it appears to be. Okay, if we can zoom out again and take a look at the photo in the lower left, that's uh, the person that appears to be looking at the canister. Yes. The if, propane tank. That's the person looking at the canister, right? Correct. And did that person notice anything else about that corner? Right, so that, that's sustained. You'll need to rephrase. In the video or in the photograph, does it depict the person looking anywhere else besides the canister? Yes. Where does it look? Looks below uh, where he's about where he's standing in that area. Looks down in that direction and. Um, and where is his attention focusing at? As it's depicted. Um, I couldn't really tell exactly what he's looking at, but it, it, it would be in the you know, direction down below uh, before the, the uh, propane tank. So uh, it depicts him fiddling with the canister, correct? That current one uh, would be. Okay. If I can direct your attention to uh, Exhibit 30F. Do you recall the video that matched the photos of, um, of these photos? Yes. And this is the photo with a date embedded of 125-2017 at about 2006, so that will bring it to 8 o'clock-ish? Correct. And this is the time when two women are entering the house? Correct. And in the video clip, 
we saw the woman in the white hat going back to the door to look what appeared to be locking the door. That accurate. Could you say that last part again? In the video version, there is a depiction of the woman in the white hat locking the door. Don't recall that? Don't recall it one way or the other. They, they were walking back and forth uh, in and out towards the car a couple of times. So yeah. I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, yesterday was a long time ago. Um, the, uh, so the camera was shut off at some point on the 27th, um, on the, excuse me, the 27th in the morning around 7 o'clock. That's here? Well, I object on several points. First, I think the date is incorrect. Second, that goes beyond uh, this witness's particular knowledge. I'll rephrase the question. All right, you can rephrase. So, we ended your direct testimony with you showing that the last time the camera was on, on January 27th in the morning. Correct, I think it was at 6.57. About 7 o'clock. Correct. And um, the, so it doesn't depict anything happening later that day? No, it does not. There's no video that I, I, I viewed. Right, so we don't know if anybody came back that day? I don't know. And the camera didn't depict anybody going at 4 o'clock in the morning on the morning of Saturday? Uh, that I don't know. And it, and it doesn't depict anything that happened on the later on the 28th Saturday. This is just that one video after the uh, after the short one, shortened one. Okay. And the the last video that we saw, the one that embedded 127 at 9 a.m. Right. Correct. That's when about when the home the person in purple. Return to, return to the home? I, I don't know what time he got there. Okay, and you don't know the individuals in the photos? I don't know any of the individuals in the photos okay. at all. And you didn't create the exhibits? I did not. Uh, you didn't select the exhibits? I did not. You didn't see the full videos of any of the videos that we saw? I just saw the 15 that, I, that we were that lish, at lish initially listed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any redirect? Yeah, but those 15 video files, you saw the complete video files, not just the clips that were shown. That's correct. <clears throat> Any recross based on that? Do you understand the uh, how the video files work? I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you understand whether or not there are other video files? I would assume there are other video files. And do you understand how many of them there are? I have no idea. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you. May this witness be released? Yes. <clears throat> All right. State, call your next witness, please. Yes. The state calls Joshua Caldwell. And as Mr. Caldwell is coming in the courtroom, could I see counsel at the bench?
Right, good morning. So when you reach the witness stand, please come around the back. I am going to ask you to remain standing and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give to the jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the penalties of perjury? Yes, sir. All right, please be seated. And so, sir, I, I know the prosecution is going to conduct your direct examination. Before we begin, would you kindly state your name for the jury? Uh, Joshua Caldwell. And Mr. Caldwell, the jury can see, and you can see as well on the screen, that there is uh, what's referred to as an order of immunity uh, benefiting you in the sense that uh, you cannot be prosecuted for any information uh, you provide here today that could tend to incriminate you. Do you understand that? I do. And do you, have you had the benefit of counsel to explain the significance of an immunity order to you? I have. Um, and do you understand that although there is an immunity order, you do have the obligation to tell the truth here? Yes, sir. And do you understand that if you do not tell the truth about a material issue, you could be prosecuted for perjury? I do. Attorney Hinckley. Thank you. <clears throat> Please introduce yourself to the jurors. My name is Josh Caldwell. What town do you live in? A Summersworth. And do you work? I do. And what do you do? Uh, I'm a business development officer for a uh, drug and alcohol treatment center. And what does that job involve? I, um, I, go, I work with uh, different community members, uh, different community resources, and I uh, tell them about the program I work for, and then when somebody is in need of uh, treatment, they'll call me up and I'll help them get into treatment. And for about how long have you done that job for? About? A about a year and a half. Did you have a similar job uh, prior to your present position? I did. You're nervous, right? Very much so. Okay. You're a recovering drug addict, right? I am. Have you also been convicted of drug felonies in federal court? I have. What's the current status of that case? That case is over. About how long ago did it end? <clears throat> Two years, I want to say, three years. I, I don't remember exactly. During your testimony, will you be testifying about your own illegal drug activities back in 2016 and 2017? Yep, we and, will. And for that, you're testifying under that grant of immunity? I am. The judge went over it with you, but I want to read it, and then I'll have some follow-up questions. Pursuant to RSA 516.34 by letter dated September 13, 2023, an accompanying motion, the Attorney General for the State of New Hampshire has requested an order from this court requiring Joshua Caldwell to provide testimony in the trial of State of New Hampshire versus Timothy Verrill, which testimony Joshua Caldwell may likely refuse to provide on the basis of his privilege against self-incrimination. In his request, the Attorney General has stated that in his judgment, the testimony of Joshua Caldwell is necessary to the public interest. Pursuant to RSA 516.34, and based upon the Attorney General's request, the court orders that Joshua Caldwell shall testify in the trial of State of New Hampshire versus Timothy Verrill. Further, no testimony or other information compelled under this order or any information directly or indirectly derived from such testimony or other information may be used against Joshua Caldwell in any criminal case of forfeiture. However, Joshua Caldwell may be prosecuted or subject to any penalty or forfeiture for any perjury, false swearing, or contempt committed in answering or failing to answer or in producing or in failing to produce evidence in accordance with this order. So you went over it with the good judge, but again, what do you understand this grant of immunity to mean to you? So it means that anything I say um, today um, can't be used against me in a current uh, or a future uh, investigation on me. And what is your obligation under that grant of immunity? To tell the truth. So getting to this sentence, no testimony or other information <coughs> compelled in this order or any information directly or indirectly derived from such testimony may be used against you in any criminal case of forfeiture, right? Correct. That's your protection, right? Yes, sir. It has been suggested, sir, that you kill Christine Objection. Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini. Right. <clears throat> Why don't you come forward?
Mr. Caldwell, it has been suggested or implied that you murdered Christine Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini. Did you kill them? No. Did you stab Jenna to death? No. Did you stab and beat Christine to death? No. Did you have any role in the death, sir? No. Are you going to be testifying about your own illegal activities back in 2016, 2017? I am. Did you commit murder, sir? No. Before we discuss those events from late 2016, 2017, you've given sworn testimony in this same matter? I have. Have you also given earlier recorded statements to investigators and given sworn testimony before a grand jury? I have. Have you been given to review the trial transcript or any other transcripts from previous statements or testimony that you've been given? Have you been given the transcripts to review? No. What are you going to be testifying based on, sir? My memory? Would it be fair to say that at this time, some of your memories as to details such as telephone numbers, you may not remember that? That's correct. Are you going to be telling the jury the truth? I am. Did you kill those women, sir? No. I want to turn your attention to the beginning of 2017. In what town were you living? What was that? Let me ask this. You didn't know Jenna Pellegrini, did you? No. Did you know Christine? I did. What was your relationship with Christine? I knew her from s selling drugs. Were you friendly with her? I was. Did you kill her? No. Did you slash her throat? <laughs> no. Who were you living with back at the time? My ex-girlfriend. And who was that, sir? Cassie. Do you currently have any form of relationship with Cassie? No. Um, at the time, uh, what was her last name? Russell. Do you even know if she still has that same last name now? I don't know. When was the last time you remember having any contacts with Cassie? That you remember? Uh, a few years ago, when I was working as a bartender somewhere, and she came in for a drink. Back in 2016, 2017, when you had a relationship with Cassie, where were the two of you living in Farmington? On Central Street. Was it 54 Central Street? That sounds correct. And in the beginning of 2017, you were selling drugs, right? I was. What kind of drugs were you selling back then? Methamphetamine, uh, mainly methamphetamine, but uh, methamphetamine, generic Viagra, um, cocaine. Were you selling drugs with or for anyone? Yes. And who were you selling drugs with or for at the time? Um, I was selling drugs uh, with uh, um, Dean, Christine, and Tim. Tim, that's Timothy Vero? It is. And you see Mr. Verrill in the courtroom? Yep. And can you please identify him for the record, describe what he's wearing? He's sitting over there uh, wearing a, a, a sweater vest, or a sweater, uh, like, uh, I, I, I don't know what, it's a sweater. May the record reflect that the witness has identified Mr. Verrill, the defendant. Any objection? No. <clears throat> it will. Hey, Mr. Caldwell, I see you get an emotional when you're pointing out Mr. Barrow. He's your friend. He's your friend, right? He was my friend, yeah. And we're going to be seeing a lot of text messages. There were friendly text messages between you and Mr. Barrow, right? Yep. Testifying here is, is hard on you for a lot of reasons, right? Yes. It's one of those reasons because you're the killer. No. Back in the beginning of 2017, what was your illegal relationship with Mr. Barrow? I sold drugs with him and bought drugs off of him. For about how long had you had that relationship, the drug dealing aspect? 
About? I don't know, less than a year. When you said that Mr. Barrell, the defendant, would sell you drugs, would that be for your personal use, or would you resell them, or would it be both? Both. And you were also friends with the defendant at the time, right? I was. At that time, the beginning of 2017, for about how long had you known the defendant and been friends with him? About. So off and on for a couple of years. And if you can explain that to the jurors, what do you mean by off and on a couple of years? So I knew him um, from before. Uh, he, he was roommates with uh, another mutual friend of ours. And, um, and so I would go over to that house and Tim would be there. Was there a point in time where you reconnected closer in time to 2017? Yes. About when was it that you reconnected with the defendant, Mr. Verrill? About. I, I don't know. I don't, like, summertime, I want to say somewhere around the summertime of 2016. At the end of 2016, the beginning of 2017, about how often would you and the defendant spend time together? Quite a bit. And when you say quite a bit, are we talking that you'd see each other daily, a few times a week? A few times a week. <laughs> Back in the beginning of 2017, did the defendant drive a car? He did. Do you remember what kind of car he drove? I believe it was a CRV. So up on the screen is State's Exhibit 71. Uh, does the car that's depicted in these photos, does it look like the car that the defendant drove back in the 2017? Yes. What were some of the things that you and Mr. Verrill did as friends together back in 2016, 2017? Hang out, listen to music, uh, do a lot of art. You also talked briefly about your illicit interactions with the defendant, that he would sell you drugs, that he would use or resell. What about the defendant in drug use? Did you see him use drugs as well? I did. And what kind of drugs was the defendant using in the beginning of 2017 that you remember? Cocaine, methamphetamine, um, DMT, heroin. I, I, Jurors probably know about cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin. They heard DMT from a witness yesterday. They may not be familiar with DMT. What is DMT? It's like a hallucinogenic. In the beginning of 2017, how would you describe the defendant's use? By that, from what you saw, what the defendant told you, was his drug use increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? with respect to previous months that you'd been his friend? I'd say increasing. When you, not, uh, excuse me, when you were not physically with the defendant, did he and you still maintain contact with each other, both as friends and as business associates? Can you repeat that question, please? Yep. When you weren't physically with the defendant, hanging out with him, would you communicate with him both as friends as well as yes. business associates, drug yes. dealers? And how would you communicate with the defendant? Through phone. You talked about how you and the defendant reconnected in 2016, uh, began seeing each other as friends frequently. Where was the defendant living when the two of you reconnected? Uh, when, we re when we first reconnected? Yeah. Farmington. And where was the defendant living in Farmington? Uh, on Meadowboro Road. That's the 979 Meterboro Road, the house of Dean Smaronk and Christine Sullivan that we'll be talking about? I don't know the exact number, but yes, it's uh, the house that Dean and Christine were living in. And when the defendant was living at that house, was anyone else living there with him? No, I, I don't think so, no. Uh, what about Dean Smaronk and Christine Sullivan? Oh, yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. So that was just... My bad question. So yep. the defendant wasn't living with a roommate or anybody, but he was living with Dean Smronk and Christine Selby. Yes. And what was the relationship at the time between the defendant, Mr. Verrill, and Dean Smronk and Christine Sullivan? I think they were friends and co-workers. And with say. respect to co-workers, yep. dealing drugs, right? Correct. Let's talk now about Dean Smaronk and Christine Sullivan. About when did you first meet them? 
About. I want to say it was probably late summer. Maybe, yeah, late summer. And when you say late summer, is this 2016 before the murders that we're t we'll be talking about? Yes. In terms of how you came to know Dean Smrock and Christine Sullivan, was that through the defendant or had you known either Mr. Smrock or Ms. Sullivan independently from the defendant? Uh, through the defendant. So the defendant was living with them at the time and the defendant introduced you to Mr. Smronk and Ms. Sullivan? Yes. Yes? Yes. How was it that the defendant introduced you to Mr. Smronk and Ms. Sullivan? In other words, was it a social setting? Was it related to drug dealing, if you remember? Yeah, it was, uh, it was in relation to uh, the drug stuff. And how did you start helping the defendant, Dean Smronk and Christine Sel Sullivan, to sell drugs? What was your initial role in that operation? Was to collect money. And if you can explain that to the jurors, what do you mean by collect money? So if somebody owed money to them, uh, they would ask me to go and get the money for them. And did you actually assist Dean Smronk, the defendant, or Ms. Sullivan in helping to collect drug debts? Um, yes. And how many times did you do that? I don't remember. More than a few? What's more than a few? Yeah. Uh, ten? No. Did you also eventually sell drugs as part of that operation? I did. And actually, let's, let's actually go back to your role in debt collection. Because we're dealing with a, an illegal business, right? Correct. So how would you collect the debt? Um, uh, just being aggressive. And you're a pretty big guy, right? I am. And that's what you did as part of the drug roll? Yep. Yeah. You eventually started selling drugs as well? I did. What was the dynamics or the hierarchy of that drug selling operation involving the defendant, Smronk, and Ms. Sullivan and you? What, what, what was the hierarchy for that? Um, it would be like uh, Dean, Christine, Tim, and then I would be underneath Tim. So in terms of who would get the drugs to sell, who would get the drugs? I don't understand the question. Yep. The drugs would come from somewhere. Who would get those drugs initially to disperse? Oh, for uh, Dean and Christine. And the defendant, would he sell drugs for them? He would. And you would sell drugs both for them as well as for your friend, the defendant? Yep. I'm sorry, did I hear an answer? Uh, yes. <clears throat> So next on the screen is State's Exhibit 32A. Do you recognize the location depicted in these various photographs, Mr. Caldwell? I do. And uh, what is this? That's um, Dean and Christine's house. The roadway shown at the bottom two photos indicated by the red arrow, yep. is this a driveway that leads up to the residence? It is. Uh, was this driveway that's pointed out by the red arrow, is that the only vehicle access to the house? Yes. So when you reconnected with the defendant, he was living at this house with Dean Smaronk and Christine Sullivan? Correct. Was this house referred uh, by yourself and others by any nicknames? Yes. And what were some of the nicknames that you referred to it as? Uh, the Ranch, The Hill. And what about the defendant, Mr. Smaronk? Would they also refer to that? by those nicknames that you remember? They would. Back in the beginning of 2017, was this a house equipped with surveillance cameras? It was. And how did you know that surveillance cameras were at the house? Well, you could see them. And where generally were surveillance cameras located at the house from what you remember? When you first, like when you're driving up the driveway, um, there were some facing the house. There was some uh, underneath the, the house facing the door and inside the house. So there were both some exterior surveillance cameras as well as some interior surveillance cameras? Correct. And you knew about them? I did. What about Mr. Verrill, the defendant? 
Yes. I want to show you some still photos taken from surveillance video. This is State's Exhibit 30E. Uh, first, with respect to these particular stills and other video stills that we're going to be seeing during the course of your testimony, Mr. Caldwell, did you review the videos from which these stills were taken? Yes. Do you recognize the person who circled in red in these still photographs? I do. And who is this? That's Tim. With respect to the three color photographs, do you recognize where the defendant, Mr. Verrill, is in those three photographs? I do. In, in what area of the house is that? That's uh, down in the basement. What about where the defendant is in the black and white photograph on the lower right? That's also in the basement, but when you first walk in. And the physical relationship between those two rooms, are they right next to each other? Yeah, it goes black and white to color. So next on the screen are two still photographs taken from State's Exhibit 30. Do you recognize the two people in these photos? I do. And who's circled in uh, red and who's circled in blue? I'm circled in red and Dean is circled in blue. This next slide has the same two still photos and the timestamps on the bottom have been highlighted in red and enlarged, showing about 10 minutes before 4 a.m. on January 25th. We're going to be getting into this a little bit later, but do you remember what generally was happening at the time that these still photographs were taken? Yeah, Dean was getting ready to go to Florida. And how was he planning to get to Florida? Uh, to fly. And from where was he planning to leave? Uh, Boston. Next are still photos from State's Exhibit 34. Uh, the timestamp on these photos is about 90 minutes later. There's a person circled in blue. Do you recognize this person? I do. And who is it? That's Dean. And you testified that another person who you met through the defendant was Christine Sullivan. What was your relationship again with Christine Sullivan at the beginning of 2017? I sold drugs with her. About how often would you have contact with Ms. Sullivan in that time period? Occasionally. This next slide has photos from State's Exhibit 30F. Do you recognize the person uh, circled in purple in these still photographs? I do. And who is that? That's Christine. In the top left still photo, there's a person circled in green. Her back is to the camera, but you, again, saw the videos. Uh, we're going to go to that person in a moment. Looking at the car in this next slide, it states it's given 36. Do you recognize whose car this is in the photographs? I do. And whose car is that? That's Christine's. What about where that car is parked, Mr. Caldwell? Does that, is that a place where she would typically park a car at the residence? It is. <clears throat> Let's go to that other woman who was circled. Do you recognize this person? I do. And who is it? That's Jenna. Okay. Back at the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, did, did you know a woman by the name of Jenna Pellegrini? I did not. How you came to know her, that's something that we're going to talk about later in your testimony, fair it to say? It is. You spoke about this illegal drug dealing business that you were involved in with Dean Smaronk, the defendant, and Christine Sullivan. To your knowledge, was Jenna Pellegrini ever involved in that operation? I don't know. When you met Dean Smronk and Christine Sullivan through the defendant in 2016, what was the nature of their relationship, Mr. Smronk and Ms. Sullivan? Uh, they were dating. And they were also living together at the Meadowboro Road residence? They were. And to be clear, was anyone living with the defendant, Mr. Smronk, and Ms. Sullivan when the three of them lived at the house? Not that I know of. And when they were living at the house, they were also selling drugs and using that house as a base of operations, fair that to say? Is, that is correct.
You said that when you reconnected with the defendant, he was living at the house on Meadowboro Road. Did at some point in time he move out of that house? He did. Do you remember where the defendant moved to? And by where, I mean town, not specific address. Uh, Dover. What about Dean Smaronk and Christine Sullivan? Did they remain at the house on Meadowboro Road when the defendant left? They did. After the defendant moved out of that house, did he still frequently go to the house from what you saw and what the defendant would tell you? Yes. Can I get a drink of water? Let's move. He's asking for water. <clears throat> My colleague's going to get you something to drink. Thank you. Apologies. You want to wait? Nope. Let's move forward to the beginning of 2017. Uh, was the defendant living in Dover then? Yes. And did he have a girlfriend? He did. Thank you. Do you happen to remember what her name was? Crystal, I think. Next on the screen are photos from State's Exhibit 12A. And again, you saw the video from which these stills were taken, right? I did. Uh, who is the man in the white hat? That's and Tim. who is the woman in the red jacket next to him? That's Tim and uh, his girlfriend. So the defendant was living with his girlfriend at the beginning of 2017. What about Dean Smaronk and Christine Sullivan? Were they still at the Meadowboro Road residence? They were. At the beginning of 2017, were Dean Smaronk and Ms. Sullivan also in their personal relationship as well, the romantic relationship? They were. And how would you describe that relationship? Volatile. And how so? Um, Dean was a jerk. I, I would use stronger language if yeah, I... Yeah, you, you actually used it before. How, how would you characterize how Dean Smaronk treated Christine Sullivan? He was a dick. Would he often talk negatively, disparagingly about Ms. Sullivan from what you heard? Yes. And would he talk negatively about her to both you and the defendant? Yes. What kind of negative things would he talk about to you and the defendant that you remember about Christine Sullivan? we just call her a bunch of heinous names. What was the nature of the relationship between those three? Mr. Smronk, Ms. Sullivan, and the defendant, as well as yourself at this time, the beginning of 2017, pertaining to the drug selling operation. Were the four of you still selling drugs? We were. And was the hierarchy still that we talked about with Dean and Christine as the suppliers, the defendant selling both on his own and to you? Yes. While you were selling drugs at the beginning of 2017, did there come a point when you started taking over some of the defendant's buyers for him? I did. And how did that come about? Why did that happen? Just because it was becoming pretty unreliable. Who is becoming unreliable? Uh, Tim. And at this time, at the beginning of 2017, did you notice a change in the defendant's behavior? I did. And what did you see happening with respect to the defendant? What you he, both saw and what you experienced with him? He was just getting really paranoid, acting really off. And if you can explain that more for us. What do you mean by paranoid? What do you mean by off? Like, and, and actually, to put this in context, the defendant is still using drugs at this time, I take it? He is. Still heroin, cocaine, hallucinogenics, meth. So I don't know about heroin. Objection, but Your Honor. Yes. I think the question is, is too vague and he needs to specify how he knows that. And also a compound question asking about variety. Right. You can lay a further foundation for how he would know. During this time, you would socialize with the defendant? I would. You would do friend things with him, right? Correct. Talked about you two would paint and do things like that. Yeah. Right? Would you also use drugs with the defendant? We did. And what type of drugs would you see the defendant using in this period of time? Again, about the beginning of 2017. Cocaine, um, methamphetamine, DMT. I, I don't think I saw him use heroin in 2017. Thank you for clarifying yeah. that for me. So with respect to the defendant's paranoia, his odd behavior, explain that for us. What were you seeing in his behavior that was, was causing just, you concern? 
he was getting um, just uh, like he was forgetting things. He was getting super paranoid. Um, he was getting pretty delusional. If you can give some examples, let's talk about the paranoia, for example. Did you ask for an example? Yes, okay. with respect to paranoia. Um, there was a time that I came to his house, um, and we were talking, and um, there was a uh, like a like it looked like an old timey camera, is what I recall. Um, and I asked him about it, and then um, I don't know how long after, a couple days later, day later, uh, he asked me if I'd uh, put cameras in his house uh, to watch him. And was this something that he was relaying to you as some kind of joke based on his demeanor and how he was saying this? No. Did he sound serious? Yes. He thought you were spying on him? He did. The defendant's changed behavior as paranoia. Was that something that concerned you as his friend? Yes. Was the defendant's behavior something that you talked to him about? It was. More than once? Yes. And what were some of the things that you talked to the defendant about, about his changed behavior? Just that I was concerned. I, I offered to bring him to a doctor to get it checked. What kind of doctor? Like a psychiatrist or some sort of mental health doctor. Though I wouldn't have used that verbiage back then. Did you also speak to other people about the change in behavior that you observed in the defendant that concerned you during this period? Yes. Who do you remember talking to that you remember? Uh, Dean, Christine. You had your girlfriend at this time, Cassie? Yes. You remember talking to her yes. as well? Mason? All right, sustained. <clears throat> At the beginning of 2017, you're selling drugs with Dean Smrock and Christine Sullivan and with the defendant? I am. On occasion, did you discuss the drug dealing operation with any of them over a cell phone by way of text messages? I did. And when doing so, were code terms used for aspects of that drug dealing? They were. And if you could give some codes or some examples of codes that we'll probably see later in some text messages. Like snowplow accounts. I can't think of any. And in terms of snowplow accounts, what they, would they actually be referring to? Cocaine. You testified that as well as spending time with the defendant as friends, you contact him by cell phone. Did you also communicate with Dean Smronk and Christine Sullivan by cell phone? I did. More so one than the other? <sighs> yes. Who? Uh, who would you contact more, Dean or Christine? Dean. Judge, I'm sorry, did you say 215 or 230? Well, 1215. Uh, <laughs> I can go yes, to 215. 12, uh, 1215, <laughs> so folks, we're going to take the lunch hour now. Uh, we'll take a full hour. We're going to return at 1.15. I do have a couple of matters I have to attend to in the hour, so I apologize that it's a lengthy lunch. We'll see you at 1.15. <clears throat>
U.S. Marshal Office. Yeah. yeah. At first he said it had to be two separate, but he said since one is going to be video, I think you put both in there. So what I said in the bit itself, the hearing scheduled for the Nintendo Play Night, that I folded that it was going to be a video hearing. And then separately, in person, um, I folded that it was in person for travel parents on April 2. So I'm not sure if we're talking about the same. One this, morning. this morning. Okay. All right. I'll go back and take a look at it. Do you still want the video um, hearing? The state is suggesting that a council proffer on the record here is satisfactory. But if you don't need, so if you want that hearing for Mr. Pelletier to be present, I'm happy to do it. I I, I think as long as his attorney uh, mm -hmm. is okay with it. Uh, but if there's going to be any challenge to right. whether or not he's justified, then I think he should be yeah. available for examination. Why, why don't we keep it? The wiser course is to have the witness present. So we'll go ahead and keep it.
jury will be in in just a moment. Uh, Mr. Caldwell, if you want to come back to the witness stand. And they'll be coming through that door in just a moment. So you can have them come in as soon as they're ready. Nope, just stand up for now. Yeah. seat then we'll wait until they're All right, Attorney Hinckley, when you are ready. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Caldwell, before the lunch break, we were talking generally about cell phone communications, and we're going to go into specific communications. Up on the screen is a chart, States Exhibit 24, that the jurors have seen many times before. There's an entry on the chart with your name followed by a telephone number, 603-509-8673. Sitting here today, do you remember whether that was your cell phone number at the beginning of 2017? I couldn't honestly tell you. Okay. Uh, could reviewing prior testimony that you gave closer in time perhaps refresh your recollection? Perhaps. you to read from 1 to 6, lines 1 to 6. So obviously there's a number in there. Does that jog your recollection at all? It doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. That being said, uh, you gave sworn testimony in this matter, right? I did. And uh, you provided the cell phone number at the time, right? Yes. And at the time that you gave the cell phone number, Back then, it was in your memory, right? It was. And you're being honest back then. Of course. Counsel, with that, I'm going to offer the number 603-509-8673, which is the number highlighted. Yes. Is there any objection? All right. <clears throat> That'll be admitted as substantive testimony. Uh, sitting here today, do you remember what cell phone numbers the defendant, Dean Smronk, and Christine Sullivan had back in 2017? I do not. So next on the screen is a calendar for the week beginning January 23rd, 2017. We're going to review numerous cell phone communications that occurred around and in this time period, which for the record are contained in States Exhibit 17. You've reviewed the text messages before that we're going to be looking over. I have. Is it fair to say that sitting here today, some of the text communications from seven years ago are more memorable than others? Is that fair to say? Yes. Have you discussed these very same text messages that we're going to be going over in previous proceedings back in this case, closer to 2017? I did. The communications that we're going to be showing on the screen, all of which you reviewed before, do they accurately reflect who was exchanging the messages, the sender and the recipient? You, they did. They do. So with that in mind, uh, let's review the text messages. The slide being shown is a series of three text messages from January 21st and two from January 22nd. I'm going to read those text messages first, Mr. Caldwell, and then I'm going to have some follow-up questions for you. So we're starting with Saturday, January 21st. 
you to Dean Smaronk, hey bro, you're gonna come down, then Dean Smaronk to you, yes, I'm pissed, I was up all night on three hours sleep and made the mistake of closing my eyes without operating something like a car, a piece of equipment, or a machine gun to keep me up, LOL, I'm getting dressed, I'm sorry, bro. And then a text message, you to Dean Smaronk, ha 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 ha, it's all good, bro. And then there's two from Sunday, January 22nd. The first is a text message from you to Dean Smaronk. Hey, bro, thank you so much for coming down and hanging out with me and my brothers. It means a lot to me for you to come down when I know you are so busy. But truly, I consider you a brother and proud to call you that. Love and respect, brother. And then Dean Smaronk sends you a text message. I was glad to be there, bro. Quite the clan of good dudes. It was great to get a break from here and the change of scene was very cool. Unfortunately, I came up the hill, helped Christine, and passed out when I sat down on the couch. Just woke up and think I'll get some more Z's in bed. Talk later. Those text messages that I just reviewed, those are between you and Dean Smaronk? They are. In the first text message, you wrote, uh, bro. What kind of term is bro? Hey, bro, you still coming down? Uh, it's what I call people. And is that a term that you use just with Dean Smaronk or with other people as well? I, uh, with other people as well. Did you hear Dean Smaronk call people bro as well? Yes. So in the first text message, you asked whether Dean Smaronk was going to come down. And then the early morning text on the next day, you thanked him for coming down and hanging out with your brothers. Those portions of the text messages are highlighted in red. Uh, where were you talking about in these text messages? Uh, the clubhouse. While you were selling drugs, were you a member of a motorcycle club? I was. And the clubhouse you're referring to is the motorcycle clubhouse? It is. <coughs> Dean Smaronk, in the last text message on the screen, wrote that he was going to the hill to help Christine. Highlighted in yellow, and then I'm pointing out with the clicker. What is the reference to uh, hill? Uh, the house up in Meterboro Road. And that, again, is a term that you would refer to it as the hill? It is. So let's continue with January 22nd and turn to three text messages from later that same day. We have a text message from you to Dean Smronk. Hey, bro, just wanted to let you know I got a text from our friend again, and he said he couldn't come yesterday because he was feeling confused again. I'm starting to get real worried about him. Then a text from Dean Smronk to you. Tough luck. Uh, tough love. He's not said a thing to me. He's not being confused. He's being stupid, and I won't let it slide. And then you a text to Dean Smaronk, okay, bro. Who is the our friend being written about, which is highlighted in red? And what is the subject of the text message exchange between you? All right, compound. You can break the question down into two. Sure. <clears throat> Who is the our friend that's being written about that's highlighted in red in your first text message here? I'm talking about Tim. And what is the subject of this text message exchange between you and Dean Smaronk about the defendant, Tim Verrill? Uh, about him getting confused and... Who told you that he was feeling confused again? Um, Tim did. And what do you remember about the defendant telling you that he was feeling confused? What do you remember about that? If you do. I... I mean, he, I just remember him telling me, I... He would tell me that he was getting confused, um, and that he would also tell me that he just needed to get some sleep. Who are you starting to get real worried about, as you wrote in the first text message highlighted in yellow? I'm starting to get real worried about him. Who are you referring to? Tim. And again, why were you getting real worried about the defendant, Mr. Vero. Because he was, I mean, uh, it says it in the text because he's getting confused. You were using drugs at this time, right? I was. You knew other people who were using drugs at this time, right? I did. And the defendant was using drugs at this time? He was. The defendant is who you were getting real worried about? He was. Continuing with text messages between you and Dean Smaronk. Now we're going to Monday, January 23rd. 
Let me read through these text messages, Mr. Caldwell, as well as the ones on the next slide, and then I'm going to have some follow-up questions. So we start here, Dean Smronk, to you. Are you able to see me today to talk about my options? Then you to Dean Smronk. Absolutely, brother. I have some running around to do this morning, but I should be there around noon, 1 p.m. Is that cool? Then Dean Smronk to you. Yeah, me too. Got to go to town clerk. Then you to Dean Smronk. You need a ride? Uh, then again, you to Dean Smronk. I'm in Rochester right now doing some more intel on that matter from Saturday after I can swing up and grab you. And then you to Dean Smronk. I'm heading your way, bro. Then Dean Smronk to you. Okay, bro, I've gotten all stressed out and don't have a cool head, but I'm ready. Then think you can still call it, think you can still call it dude that he rides with. And then you to Dean Smronk, yup. Followed by you to Dean Smronk. No answer, bro, only have Facebook Messenger. Sorry if I hear back and confirm the insect problem is now affecting the house. I will let you know. They usually will set up a web for the night if it is. And then we finish up, Dean Smronk to you, cool, cool. Mr. Caldwell, do you remember what Dean Smronk was discussing with respect to his options from the previous slide that we saw and what he's writing about in these slides? Um, talking about um, an individual that uh, had beat up Christine and uh, options on how we could, like, what we were going to do about it. It, it, the individual, is that relating to the insect problem and setting up a web? Overall, go ahead. <clears throat> it is. Uh, who was that person? Um, his nickname was Spider. So uh, we, that's why I, I used that. His, his, Mike um, Detroit. But people uh, knew him as Spider? Sp spider, Spider Mike. And that's what the reference to insect problem in web is? It is. Let's continue with January 23rd. The last text message ended at 7.03. This next exchange begins about four hours later that same evening of the 23rd. Again, let me read them and then I'm gonna have some follow-up questions. And here we're starting, uh, you to Dean Smronk. Hey bro, so I told my friend told from my friend that they don't think he was at the spot, I thought. Sorry it wasn't better news. Also got a call from my brother and he was pretty upset with the waiting and lack of communication. He said he, and then it follows another text message, you to Dean, wouldn't like to deal with him anymore. And then Dean Smronk to you, have you talked to Tim? And then you follow up, I have not yet. In the first text message, you refer to speaking with a friend as well as getting a call from your brother. With respect to your brother, is that an actual blood relative or are you referring to somebody else? Uh, talking about somebody else. Who is the subject of these several text messages between you and Dean Smaronk? The person who was not at the spot and who your brother did not want to deal with anymore? Uh, the first one that they don't think he was at the spot, uh, talking about a spider. Uh, and then in the second one, it's, uh, you don't have it highlighted, but that's continuing on talking. It says, also got a call from my brother. Uh, I'm talking about my brother, quote unquote, right? Uh, that wouldn't like to deal with Tim anymore. So the, what I'm pointing out with the clicker, okay. this is a conversation, a separate conversation. The first one is about Spider. Yep. The second, starting here, continuing to here, is about Tim. So, uh, so got a call from my brother. It wasn't talking about Tim. It was talking about somebody else. But uh, wouldn't like to deal with him anymore. That's talking about Tim. And what was that about? About buying drugs off of him anymore. And why wasn't the person wanting to deal with the defendant anymore? Uh, because he was uh, not showing up on time, uh, not taking his calls. And when you say he wasn't showing up on time, not taking his calls, you're talking about Mr. Verrill, the defendant? I am. Continuing with the next two text messages from later that same night, let me read them first. First is a lengthy text message, you to Dean Smaronk. 
I can, that's no problem. I feel bad, really, but I also know that he told him a time and he counted on that time because in turn he told others that same thing and he ran out of time. Don't mean to add stress onto you, brother. I will just explain to Tim and hope he understands. It's starting to freezing rain right now. Be careful if you plan on going out tonight at all. I will update you after I've spoken to him. Love and, my, love and respect my brother. And then a text message, Dean Spronk, to you. Okay, well, I didn't answer my comment a little while ago, and I'm starting to get things finished that were critical items. Then I'm going back, then I'm going to pack and crash for a little while, but I'll be back in touch. Love and respect. Do these texts appear to be a continuation of the text conversation that you had with Dean Smronk earlier that day about the defendant, Mr. Verrill? It does. And what do you mean when you wrote, I will just explain to Tim and hope he understands, highlighted in red? What was that um, a reference to? I believe it was, um, like, picking up the money and uh, doing, the, doing the transaction for him. So you were actually going to take his place because of the issues that he was having, communicating with people and meeting with people? Yes. The text messages that we've been discussing up to this point are between you and Dean Smrong. Was the defendant another person with whom you had regular contact by cell phone, including text messages? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sure. So the text messages that we've reviewed up to this point, it's between you and Dean Smirong, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Was the defendant somebody who you also had regular text message oh, communication yes. with? Yes. So let me read this text message sent to uh, the defendant on the evening of January 23rd, and then I'm going to have some follow-up questions for you. It's you to the defendant. Up on his toes. <clears throat> the next sec several text messages occur the next day, uh, January 24th. Let me read the first four on this slide. So we have a text message from Dean Smaronk to you. In case you're up, I'm finally crashing for about six hours. And then the defendant to you, hey bro. And then you to the defendant, hey bro, sorry, and a huge argument, argument with Cassie right now. Can I get at you in a few? And then the defendant to you, yeah. With respect to the text message sent to you at 105, hey bro, which is highlighted in red, is bro a brother a term that the defendant often used with you? Yeah. And would you use that term with him? Yes. In your response, you reference an argument you had with Cassie, highlighted in yellow. Again, who is Cassie, or who was Cassie at this point in time in your life? At that point in time, she was my girlfriend. Let's go on to the last text message from this slide, Dean Smronk to you. I'll read it first. Well, I got up on time, but I was haggard as hell, so I took a piss and laid back down, and CV said, fuck it. When I woke up, I was supposed to be leaving. Tim showed up, though, had breakfast with us, about an hour ago, then he left. I mentioned the stuff with Rob, and he said he needs to get his schedule in order or something like that. Just keeping you in the loop. Love, respect. The Tim referenced by Dean Smaronk, who is that? Tim Vero. And what about the stuff with Rob and the defendant's schedule needing to be kept in order? Is that a continuation of the text messages from earlier and the defendant's issue and not meeting with uh, buyers, basically? Correct. Continuing with text messages from the afternoon of January 24th. 
we have you to Mr. Barrell, the defendant, hey, sorry, hey, bro, sorry, and then the defendant to you, it's okay, I'm in Dover now, and then you to the defendant, shitty, were you able to get a hold of my brother yet today? Then the defendant to you hasn't gotten back to me. I uh, just talking about like how how it will be handled. I, I don't remember to be honest. Fair enough. Let's continue with January 24th. Text messages between you and Dean Smaronk. I'll again read them first. You to Dean Smaronk. Okay, bro. So you're gonna fly out later tonight or tomorrow? I can make up the hill in a little bit. I have some running around to do first. There really is not enough hours in a day. Ha ha ha. Thanks for keeping me in the loop, bro. It's appreciated. LR. Then Dean Smronk to you. Catching the 6 a.m. flight now. Then you to Dean Smronk, the last two. Right on. I will swing up then after my errands, bro. Hey, bro. Haven't forgot about you. Just trying to handle a bunch of shit right now. So what is the exchange with you and Dean Smaronk regarding flying out and catching the 6 a.m. flight, which is highlighted in red in these text messages? He was flying down to Florida. Do you know why he was flying down to Florida? I don't remember the specifics. Uh, do you recall if he was flying to Florida alone or if he was with anyone? Objection meeting. You, you already answered the question. He doesn't know. All right. Overruled. Go ahead. Do you know if he was flying to Florida alone or with anyone? Um, he was flying alone. What is the reference in the first text message to the hill, which is highlighted in yellow? Is that, again, your terminology for the Meterboro Road residents? It is. You end the first text message, LR. What is that? A uh, love and respect. In the third text message, you wrote, I will swing up then, highlighted in green. You, you'd swing up where? To the Meterboro House. The next two slides are more text messages between your cell phone and the defendant on January 24th. I'm going to read the text messages on this slide and the next, and then I'll have follow-up questions. So we start the defendant to you, hey, bro and you respond, hey bro, then the defendant to you, how's it going? And the last two are from you to him. Honestly, pretty shitty right now, but hey, we can't have all good days. You in the area. Then the defendant to you, I can be, I could use a chat. Then the next two are you to the defendant. Yeah, come on by bro, I'm cleaning out my basement right now and then gonna have dinner just sitting down for dinner, so should be free when you get here, bro. And then the defendant to you, OMW, on my way, I? Correct. And then you to the defendant, okay. I was at home. And that home being 54 Central Street in Farmington that you referred to? Correct. Had the defendant been to your house before? He had. More than once? Yes. And for what reasons would the defendant visit your home? To hang out. To sell drugs. In the second message on the screen, the defendant wrote to you that he could use a chat. Did the defendant that Tuesday evening meet at your house? He did. 
And do you remember what the defendant talked to you about at your house that evening? That was the um, conversation that I talked about earlier about uh, him thinking I set up a camera in his house. So that's when he accused you of spying on him? Correct. And again, from his language, from his demeanor, from how he was talking, did he sound serious when he was accusing you of spying on him? He did sound serious. We're going to complete text messages on January 24th with a late night exchange between you and Dean Smaronk. And for reference on the left are the text messages between the two of you from earlier that day in which you, in substance, relayed that you'd meet up with Dean Smaronk up at the hill, right? Correct. So let me read the remainder of the text messages on the right. Dean Smaronk to you, no worries. I'm rested and up until I travel at 3 a.m. Then there are two exchanges between Dean Smaronk and the defendant and a call between the defendant and Dean Smaronk's cell phone. And then the last two text messages between you and Dean Smaronk, you to Dean Smaronk. Heading your way, bro, in five. Hey, bro, knock, no answer. You might have passed out. Have a safe flight, brother. Love and respect. Again, what's Dean Smaronk's reference to travel at 3 a.m., which is highlighted in red? Going, uh, flying down to Florida. And uh, what is the reference in your two text messages at the bottom at 10.50, I'm sorry, 10.45 p.m. and 11.16 p.m., the last two that we see on the screen? Heading uh, your way in five, knock, no answer. Uh, heading to the house on Muterboro Road. So you went there, you knocked, nobody answered, and you left? Yes. It, did, did you have keys to the house in Meterboro Road? I did not. Next on the screen is State's Exhibit 32G. Do you recognize this area of the house? I do. Uh, where is this area of the house generally, and where does the green door uh, that's circled in red, where does this door lead to? So that's in the back of the house, um, and it leads into the basement. Back in the beginning of 2017, did that door have a lock? It did. And what kind of lock did it have? It was like a, I think a punch lock, like a code or something. Could you access the house using that lock? I could not. Uh, why not? Because I didn't have the, the code. What about the defendant? Could he access the house using the lock? He could. The next series of text messages between you and Dean Smirok occurs early the following morning. So now we're early in the morning on January 25th. Let me first read them, and then I will have some follow-up questions. So Dean Smirok, to you, no fucking way. Oh, man, I was in the shower. Did you come down back? Chris was here. Then you to Dean Smirok. Yeah, I was knocking on the back door. I could head back up if you want. Would like to talk before you leave anyways. Then Dean Smronk to you, bro, I would really appreciate that. I'm trying to deal with a few loose ends here. And then you to Dean Smronk, okay, cool, heading up, bro. Uh, Dean Smronk wrote that he was with Chris, highlighted in red in that first text message. Who did you understand that to mean? Christine. You indicated in substance to Dean Smronk that you wanted to speak to him and that you'd return to the house. Did you go back to Meterboro Road that early Wednesday morning before he flew off to Florida. I did. And uh, you talked about how you went up there initially, you knocked on the door, nobody answered your left. What about this time? You go back up to the house, does anybody answer this time? Yeah. And who was at the house? Uh, it was Dean and Christine. Uh, do you remember what you wanted to talk to Dean Smrock about before he left for Florida? I don't remember. I. I, I don't recall. Fair enough. That Wednesday morning, did Dean Smrock leave for his planned trip to Florida? He did. And how did he get to the airport from the house in Farmington? How did he get to where? Yep. How did he get from the house in Farmington to the airport? Christine. To fly off. Uh, did you stay at the house when they left, or did you leave as well? I left. Was anyone in the house when the three of you 
Dean Smaronk, yourself, and Christine Sullivan left the House early that Wednesday morning, January 25th? Not, that I'm, not to my knowledge. So returning to still video uh, photos of video footage, uh, who again are the two people who we see on these still photos? Uh, myself and Dean. And the date indicated in these videos, uh, January 25th, about 3.50 a.m.? Correct. And returning to States Exhibit 34, who again is the person circled in blue in these surveillance photos? Dean. Over the following days, did, after Dean Smronk left early that Wednesday morning for Florida, did you continue to have text message exchanges and phone calls with him while he was in Florida? Yes. In those following days, did you ever see Dean Smronk in New Hampshire? No. When did you next see Dean Smronk after you saw him leave for the airport that early Wednesday morning to fly to Florida? When I picked him up at the airport. And that was several days later, an event that we're going to talk about later? Correct. So let's return to cell phone communications. And this next slide has text message exchange between you and the defendant later on January 25th. And the next several slides will continue this same day. Let me read the ones on this slide. And they begin at 12.58 p.m., you to the defendant, Hey, bro, how are you feeling today? And then the defendant to you, better. And then you to the defendant, I think you should still get checked out, bro. I'm really worried about you. And then the defendant to you, I was tired last night. I've been trying to turn things around in my life. I was certain I forgot to do something yesterday, but I didn't get some good sleep last night. Now I'm chilling with my father. And then you to the defendant, okay, bro. Focusing really worried about him, the, high, the text highlighted in red. Is that more of the same that we've been talking about? Yes. And again, you believe that the defendant should get checked out by who? A doctor. What kind of a doctor? Um, like a, a psychiatrist or something to check out his head. I'm going to continue with text messages that same afternoon of January 25th. These are continuing text messages between you and the defendant. First is the defendant to you, what are you up to? And then you to the defendant, waiting for Paul to help me fix the door downstairs. The window broke out of it, so I think going to head to Newington to get a new one. Then the defendant to you, I gotta run to the ranch soon. And then you to the defendant, right on. Uh, what were you writing the defendant about in that second text message with respect to Paul and going to Newington? I was, uh, my basement door, uh, exterior basement door, uh, the window broke, and that's my cousin Paul. Uh, we're going to be seeing later on in text messages there's drug code, right? Correct. Now, this is not drug code, this is just your real life, right? Yes. The defendant wrote to you that he wanted to run to the ranch soon, highlighted in red. What did you understand that term ranch to be a reference to? Meterboro Road. What was the defendant going to the house to do based on conversations that he had with you? If you remember. I don't remember. Pick up drugs, I'm assuming. Well, we can't assume, but let me okay. re-ask it and I'll ask this. Would the defendant typically go to the house to pick up drugs for sale? Yes. Continuing text messages between you and the defendant on January 25th. Again, let me read them. First, the defendant to you is Chris up there, and then you to the defendant in the next two text messages. She should be. I know that she brought him to the airport this morning. And then the defendant uh, to you, I figured. 
And the last two are different conversants, so I will not ask you about them. The first text message, who did you understand the def defendant's reference to Chris and up there to be? Is Chris up there? Oh, Christine. I was, sorry, I was looking at the highlight and I got confused. I'll get to the highlight in a second, <laughs> but the first one is Chris up there. So yeah, you, talk, talking about Christine. And Meterborough Road? Meterborough Road, yes. Uh, what about that statement that's highlighted in red? She brought him to the airport. Is that a reference to the trip to the Boston airport to Florida? It is. The next series of text messages from January 25th, later in the afternoon, we're going back to you and Dean Smaronk. Let me read them and follow up with some questions. And, and actually, before I read these, Mr. Cole, mm -hmm. we've seen a, a lot of text messages between you and Dean Smaronk and you and the defendant. We haven't seen any between you and Christine Sullivan. Was that kind of the, the nature of your relationship yeah. at the time? Yes. So we have you to Dean Smronk. Hey bro, just had my meeting about those plowing accounts. Was wondering when we would be able to start hiring on that. He was looking for 16 untrained temps that we bill net 30, we would pay them 1500 a week. And then there's an auto reply from Dean Smronk's cell phone followed by a text message from him. Perfect, I'll work on that today and have an answer for you in a matter of hours. Then you to Dean Smronk, awesome bro, hope the weather is nice, LNR. Then Dean Smronk's last two text messages to you. A hustle here and a hustle there, life on the wild side, L and R. So explain this text message that you sent to him about plowing accounts in untrained temps. I was talking about um, cocaine and uh, 16 untrained, so 16 ounces of uncut cocaine. So this text message was a, uh, coded text message between you and Dean Smaronk about drug sales? Yes. That same afternoon of the 25th, right after the exchange that we just reviewed, there's this exchange between you and Dean Smaronk. We have Dean Smaronk to you, did Tim go to the doctor, and then you to Dean Smaronk. No, I told him I wanted to bring him and he said he had a good night's sleep so he didn't want to go but that was through text because he never came by this morning. Oops, sorry. Dean Smronk's question to you, did Tim go to the doctor? Is that a continuation of text messages that we've seen up to this point about some concerns about the defendant, Mr. Barrow? It is. From what you remember, was Dean Smronk also trying to get the defendant to consult with a doctor about his mental issues? Yes. With respect to your response to Dean Smronk asking whether or not the defendant went to a doctor, no, I told him I wanted to bring him and he said he had a good night's sleep so he didn't want to go. Was the defendant supposed to meet with you that morning if you remember? If you remember. I don't remember. Um, yeah, I can't assume, right? No, I don't remember. Fair enough. Let's continue with text messages from Wednesday, January 25th. We have more between you and Dean Smronk. First is you to Dean Smronk. Hey bro, sorry to bother you. I was just wondering what I should tell the accounts on staffing. They are chomping at the bit to fill these accounts. Heard we might be getting another storm soon. I guess they are way understaffed. The contractor they had before warrants union wages, so are still, they are at a standstill until I let them know when we would have guys available. I know you have a lot going on and I'm sorry to be a pain, brother. And then Dean Smronk to you, first is an auto reply, and then he responds Tuesday, you to Dean Smronk, awesome, thanks bro, and then him to you, NP. Uh, no problem, I take it? No problem, it? yes. Your lengthy text message at the top, is this uh, more code about a drug transaction? It is. Who was involved in the drug deal that you were discussing with Dean Smronk and code in, in this text message and in the text message that we saw before? Um, this guy named Kurt. Excuse me? This guy named Kurt. Uh, do you recall if the defendant and Ms. Sullivan was also involved in this deal? If you remember. I don't remember. I, I don't think so. Uh, 
You talked about during this period uh, before lunch, you talked about the relationship between Dean Smronk and Christine Sullivan. Uh, what about the relationship between Christine Sullivan and the defendant, Mr. Vero? Was there friction in that relationship too that you remember? Between Christine and Tim? Yeah. Yes. And what was that frustration or situation, relationship? It, um, just money being owed, I believe. And who owed who money from what you understood? Uh, Tim owed Christine money. Let's turn to the last of the text messages from January 25th. And those text messages are that evening between you and Dean Smaronk. They begin at 9.28 p.m., Dean Smaronk to you. I take it there was a good impression made, and then you to Dean Smaronk, very my brother, very, and then Dean Smaronk to you. I'm committing each and every resource to this, and it's going to be one hell of a trick, brother. And then you to Dean Smaronk, I think it's going to be a hell of a year, bro. Uh, do you remember what you and Dean Smaronk were discussing in these text messages? Um, the cocaine deal. And that's the deal that was referred to in, in coded messages that you sent to him at least twice before? Yes. So now let's turn to the next day, and we're on Thursday, January 26. Uh, we're going to be going over 10 separate slides of text messages for this day. And they start with four slides showing a series of text messages between you and the defendant beginning that morning of the 26th and continuing into that afternoon. So I'm going to first read them all, and then I'm going to have some follow-up questions for you, okay? okay? So they start with you at 10.23 a.m., you to the defendant. Hey, bro, what a your email? And then do you have a Google calendar? The next two, the defendant to you. Yo, Jimbo, 451 at Gmail. Then the next two, you to the defendant. Thanks, bro. I'm going to set up that Google calendar and let me know if you receive anything on it. Name of calendar is Hill Ranch Installations. You to the defendant, let me know if you can see it, bro. The next two, the defendant to you. Not yet. Where can I add it? And then the last two are you to the defendant. Google Calendar app. The first three on this page, the defendant to you. Got it last time. I checked. It wasn't there. Got it. I had the calendar on my phone, needed to app from store, then you to the defendant. Cool, so I figure what we would do is you add a something, all your invoice numbers will start with 01, mine 02. The defendant to you, cool. Then you, in description, we put what needs to be installed. If it is going to be billed net 30 or if paid for at end of job, then when invoice is paid, we put together, I'm sorry, we put another event up with invoice, paid in full or partial, and if partial description how much was paid, I picked the color blue and you can change your color to something also, just all installs will be clicked on as an all day event and we will just add what needs to be done, do you think will work, is it too confusing, him to you, not at all, I like it a lot. Last two, you to Mr. Verrill, the defendant. Question, also, are you going to the Hill today? I need to get up there at some point. I'm going to be leaving soon for a haircut, though no probs need to go around eight-ish. Would I call up there or would I need you? Okay, awesome. I will delete this one, get a hold of Florida, and see what his email is, and also get Christine so I can put it all together. <clears throat> So what is the subject of this lengthy text message exchange between you and the defendant on the morning and afternoon regarding Google Calendar and, and what you wrote to the defendant? So I was trying to uh, develop a system where um, when we did drug transactions, um, we would, everybody would be able to see, Dean and Christine mainly, would be able to see what was going out, how much money was getting paid, um, and then um, if money was being owed. So the references to Google Calendar and whatnot, they're all drug related, drug sale related. They are. In your last text message in this exchange with the defendant, you made references to getting email addresses from Florida and Christine, highlighted in red at the bottom. Who are you referring to, Florida and Christine? 
Florida would be Dean, and then Christine's Christine. In the preceding text message, you asked the defendant whether he was going to the hill, and you relayed that you needed to get up there, which is highlighted in yellow. The hill again, that's a reference to the Meterboro Road residence? Correct. And do you remember why you were planning to go to the Meterboro Road house uh, this particular day? To get drugs. In that same text message you wrote, would I call up there or would I need you, which is highlighted in green. Why would you need the defendant? To be able to get the drugs. And what about to get into the house? Yes. That same text message about going up to the hill is on the left for a reference. Mm -hmm. Continuing with text messages between the defendant and you on January 16th, I'll first read them. The defendant to you, I don't know what Dean want to do, but Chris is up there and she knows more than me right now. Then you to the defendant, right on bro. The defendant to you, I'll meet you there if you'd like, and then you to the defendant, cool, that would be awesome. Uh, with, refer, re, with respect to the first message, the defendant's statement, Chris is up there, who and where did you take the defendant to mean? Christine, up at Meadowboro Road. What about the defendant's statement that Ms. Sullivan knew more than he did? Do you remember what the defendant was talking about? Um, just about the business. And that business being selling drugs? Correct. The last text message here has a timestamp of 3.22 p.m. And that's when the next series of text messages start. You to the defendant, around 8 tonight work for you. The defendant to you, yes. You to the defendant, cool, I will text you when I'm ready, bro, thanks. The defendant to you, no problem. And then you to the defendant, do me a favor, bro, and set up an event and see if I can see it. Uh, starting with the last first, do me a favor, set up an event and see if I can see it. Does that refer back to the Google Calendar drug calendar that you were preparing? It is. The first t text message, you to the defendant, around 8 o'clock that evening working for him. What's that a reference to? Of uh, going up there. That's to Meterboro Road? Correct. Moving to additional cell phone record entries from Thursday, January 26. First, we have a call, Dean Smronk, to you. And then uh, three down, we have a call, you to the defendant. And then a text message, you to the defendant. Just to confirm, I was saying, could you pick me up, bring me with you, they need it before five. And as much as you can bring to donate, that would help me out a lot. And then the defendant to you, yup, NP, no problem. Do you remember receiving a call from Dean Smronk on the afternoon of January 26th? I do. And uh, what was that call about? Um, getting money to Christine. For what? Uh, for drugs that we've, we've bought. Your call to the defendant at about 4 p.m., uh, you reference it in the text message that you just send a few minutes later? I do. Just to confirm, I was saying, could you pick me up, bring me with you? Is that a reference to the call that you had just made to him? It is. What was the topic of that text message and that brief call between you and the defendant? To pick me up and bring me up to, bring me with him to go see Christine to pay up, to give her money. And again, the money was for what? Uh, drugs. And both you and the defendant were going to supply money for this? Correct. Turning to additional cell phone communications from January 26th is a series between you and Dean Smaronk. You to Dean Smaronk. Hey, just a heads up, talk with Tim. He should be at my place in the next 10 minutes. Then we are running up to the hill. And then Dean Smaronk to you, there's an auto reply and then a call that lasts about 20, 72 seconds. And then the last one is a call with other conversants. Turning to your text message, Tim should be at my place. Again, that's a reference to the defendant, Mr. Verrill? Yes. And we're running up to the hill. That's again a reference to Meterboro Road? Correct. Do you remember why you sent that text message to Dean Smaronk? Because we're, uh, to tell him that we're going to meet Christine. 
And did the defendant pick you up soon after this uh, exchange, this text message exchange? He did. The call from Dean Smronk after you sent him that text message about you and the defendant going up to the Meterboro Road address, do you remember what Dean Smronk's call to you was about? Um, to tell me to get a hold of Christine. And that call was followed by a call from your cell phone to Ms. Sullivan's uh, cell phone. Did you make that call? I did. And do you remember why generally you were trying to get a hold of Ms. To Sullivan? To see where she was. Uh, do you remember if you actually spoke to her? I, I don't remember. At some point in time, did you and the defendant arrange to meet Ms. Sullivan somewhere? Yes. And where did you arrange to meet with her? We ended up meeting at the uh, Holy Rosary Credit Union in Farmington. And in terms of how you were able to do that, you it seems like you don't have a recollection. It could have been your call with Ms. Sullivan. It yeah, could have been the she, call with Mr. Smronk. Yeah, she must have told me that she was at. And what was the purpose of the meeting between you and the defendant and Ms. Sullivan? To give her money for drugs. And did you and the defendant drive to the bank together? We did. And what do you remember happening at the bank? Um. I, at one point, I saw her car parked, and uh, I thought she was in the uh, passenger seat, so I, I well, let jumped me stop up. you there. Yep. Why'd you think she was in the passenger seat? Did you? Because I saw somebody sitting in the passenger seat. And uh, was this person's back to you? You parked behind them? I don't remember where we were parked. Okay. Fair enough. Sorry to interrupt. Yep. Continue, please. Um, and so I got out, um, and I opened the the driver's side door and I I remember I think I was trying to get in but I recognized that it wasn't Christine sitting there. Did you recognize who it was sitting there? I did not. Uh, did you later come to find out who that was? I did. And who was it? That was Jenna. Did you ever remember meeting Ms. Pellegrini before that chance encounter? No. Do you remember either Ms. Sullivan or Dean Smronk ever mentioning Ms. Pellegrini before you bumped into her outside the bank? No. So let's turn to additional text messages from January 26th. You to Ms. Sullivan's cell phone want me to wait outside and then her cell phone to you. I have her phone, LOL, and then your cell phone to Dean Smronk, all set brother. Uh, your text message to Ms. Sullivan, want me to wait outside. Explain that for us, please. Because she was in the bank, so I was wondering if she wanted us to wait for her to get out of the bank. What about the, re or the reply from Ms. Sullivan's cell phone? I have her phone, LOL. Um, that was Jenna. So Ms. Pellegrini actually had Ms. Sullivan's cell phone at the time? She did. Shortly after sending and receiving those text messages, did you see Ms. Sullivan outside the bank? I did. And what do you remember happening outside the bank? I remember coming up to her um, and hugging her and putting money into her purse as I was hugging her. Uh, what about the defendant? He did. I believe he did the same thing. Uh, do you remember if you and the defendant talked about another person being with Ms. Sullivan at the bank? At that time? Is that what you're asking? Yes, at that I, time. I don't remember. Uh, from conversations with the defendant, either that time or later on, did he know or appear to know the woman who was Ms. with Ms. Sullivan? I don't remember. Did you ever see Christine Sullivan again after seeing her outside the bank that late Thursday afternoon, January 26th? I did not. 
Did you receive any phone calls or text messages from Ms. Sullivan on her cell phone after last seeing her outside the bank that Thursday afternoon? I did not. Did you receive any communication from Ms. Sullivan of any kind, email, Facebook, anything, after you last saw her that Thursday afternoon? I did not. Do you remember where you and the defendant went after meeting up with Ms. Sullivan outside the bank to have this exchange of money for a drug purchase? To my house. Let's now turn to text messages from the evening of January 26. They begin at 8.14 p.m. The first Messages that the defendant sends to you at 8.14 p.m. Uh, where was he and what is he texting about? Latching the door, hopping out a couple of times. Um, he was at my house and uh, talking about the, uh, the door in my kitchen. And uh, he's talking about the dog that uh, Cassie and I were dog sitting who is a pain in the butt and kept running out. So this is not drug code. This is, again, real life. Correct. Uh, were you at the house at the time or you were elsewhere? I was in the house. I was just in the basement. The next, uh, the text message that the defendant sent to you at 10.38 p.m. on January 26th, <clears throat> I'm heading up the hill, highlighted in red. Where was the defendant going at that time based on this message? Um, going to Meterboro Road. Your response, I'm in Dover with Ian. Who was Ian and what were you doing with him in Dover? Uh, Ian was a good friend of mine, and we were drinking. And with respect to timing, the first two at around 8.14, and the one where you're saying you're in Dover is closer to 11. So at some point in time, you left the house? I did. So this slide and subsequent slides go into the next day, which is Friday, January 27th. The ones on the screen are all time stamped at 12.17 a.m. We first have the defendant to you, you up, and then the next three are you to the defendant, yes, at the Irving, heading home. Uh, what is your text message to the defendant at the Irving a reference to? The Irving in Farmington? A gas station? Yes. The last text message on the screen, you to the defendant, at 1217, heading home. Where were you heading home from? Dover. And your reference to home, again, is that your uh, place that you had with Cassie in Farmington? It is. The next test message exchange happens uh, about a minute later. So 1218 AM, you to the defendant, you leaving the hill, and then the next two, the defendant to you, yup, I'll stop by, and then you to the defendant, Cool. The defendant's text message to you, I'll stop by, highlighted in red. What did, what did you take that to mean? The defendant's going to come by my house. From the preceding two text message, uh, you leaving the hill, yup, where was the defendant coming from to come to your house? Uh, Meterboro. May I please get some more water? Yeah. The next series of text messages between the defendant and you occur about 15 minutes later. I'll read them and have follow-up questions. So we're starting at 12.33 a.m. You to the defendant, I'm home now. The defendant to you, leaving in five. And the last two are you to the defendant. Can you pick me up something while there? I left there. 
What were you referring to when you asked the defendant to pick you up something while there? Pick up what and from where? Drugs from me to borrowed. Continuing with text messages between you and the defendant that early morning of January 27th. And it's going to be the first three text messages on this screen. The defendant to you, yup. Then the, last, the next two are you to the defendant. I know I will be up for four hours anyways, but we'll probably need to straighten up a butt and then bit. What were you referring to in your text message to the defendant about staying up four hours to straighten up? I was asking for four ounces of uh, methamphetamine. You were asking for drugs to use? I was. After your last text message to the defendant, which is about 12.36 a.m. on Friday, January 27th, do you see the defendant at your house at 54 Central Street? I do. Do you remember about what time that was when the defendant was at your house on January 27th after that exchange of text messages that went past midnight? I don't. Uh, is that a detail that reviewing your past testimony in this matter perhaps may refresh your recollection? Yes, perhaps. So I'll ask you to start at the top mm -hmm. and to about line 18, but read as much as you want. If you want additional pages, let me know. Look, let me know. And when you're done reading, look up. Uh, reviewing that, does that refresh your recollection or is, does not? It does. About what time does the defendant arrive at your house that early morning on Friday the 27th? 1 o'clock. Around 1 o'clock. About 1 o'clock? Yeah. Yes. When the defendant came to your house at about 1 o'clock, was he alone? He was. And by what means did he arrive at your house? He drove. And that's the dark SUV that we saw photos of before the lunch break? Correct. What do you remember happening at your house when the defendant arrived? Uh, he was acting weird. What do you remember about that? He, he asked me if, uh, I known, if I knew who Jenna was. Um, uh, he, I, I remember, um, yeah, him asking me if I knew who Jenna was. Uh, I remember telling him I don't. He asked if I, he asked if I thought she was an informant. Um, and I was, I think I said, I don't know. Uh, and then, you know, he was pretty worked up about it, so I suggested him call Dean. Uh, so we called Dean. Uh, the defendant comes to your house, asks about Jenna. Does he use the name Jenna? He does. Uh, when the defendant asked you if you thought Jenna might be an informant, what did you take the defendant to mean by informant? Like if she worked for the cops. And you described the defendant as worked up as he was talking about Jenner and the possibility that she might be an informant? Yeah. Objection. It's not what he testified to. Overall. I don't believe he used those words. <clears throat> Overall. Did, are those the words that you used? He appeared worked up? He did. I did, yeah. And when you say worked up, what do you mean by that? What do you recall about the defendant's behavior, demeanor? Mannerisms. Um, he, he, he just seemed off. I, uh,
I can't really, like, I, I don't know. Like, he just seemed off. Had you ever seen the defendant acting like that before when, he, when you saw him that early Friday morning asking you about Jenner and whether you thought she was an informant? I mean, I've, I've, I, I can't recall exactly if I'd seen him like that. I'd seen him acting off before, but I don't know if, like, that particular, like, uh, how, he, how he's acting. And you remember giving sworn testimony in this case, right? I do. <coughs> Council, page 568, beginning line. Nine. Question, so does... Yeah. The defendant comes to your house, expresses concern to you that a woman named Jenna is at the house and might be a police informant. You tell him in substance, call Dean. Does the defendant call Dean from what you see? He does. And what do you remember hearing the defendant say during that call? I remember uh, him talking about Jenna and him mentioning, not the Jenna down in Florida. Seventy-one, starting with line 24, but certainly if you want to look at anything beforehand, you can. But I'll direct your attention to there. And I'm going to give you another page as well. So okay. you start reading this, and I'll get you another page while you're doing Continue 573 to line four. <coughs> yep. uh, reading that, does that jog your memory as to anything else you recall the defendant talking to Dean about during that early morning phone call? Yes. And what else do you remember? He asked if he thought he should do something about it. When you say he asked if he sh thought he should do something about it, who is the he you're talking about? Tim asked Dean if he should do something, if Tim should do something about it. 
Looking at this chart, phone records indicate a call between the defendant's cell phone and Dean Schmrunk's cell phone, 1.34 a.m. on Friday, January 27th. It lasts only about seven seconds, which is indicated by the red arrow. Uh, up to this point, Mr. Caldwell, we've gone through various communications between you, the defendant, Dean Schmrunk, a couple with Dean, Christine Sullivan, using what I call regular telephone calls and text messages. But did the four of you also communicate by cell phone through other means as well? We did. Uh, how so? Um, we used different apps. Uh, can you give some examples, if you recall? Uh, signal, um, Confide. And why would those apps be used instead of regular cell phone calls and text messages? Because they're encrypted. And what does that mean? Um, it it um, keeps the uh, records to being seen by law enforcement. The call between the defendant and Dean Schmronk that you heard at your house at early Sunday, uh, early morning of January 27th, do you know whether the defendant made that call through the cell phone itself or through an app that he and you and others used? I have no idea. Yeah. <clears throat> so, ladies and gentlemen, it's 2.30. We'll take our afternoon recess. We'll resume at 2.45 and then work until 4 o'clock. <clears throat>
again bring in the jury. Please remain standing. Um, what did Dean say? And he said not to worry about it. Um, yeah. And what else do you remember defendant Mr. Verrill talking about before he leaves? He said that he was going to uh, set up some cameras just to check on him. Set up some cameras to check on who? Uh, Christine and Jenna. And how was the defendant going to set up cameras to spy on the women at the house? Um, so it's sustained. That was not his testimony. How is he going to set up cameras to check up on the women inside the house? Um, he was going to um, use um, an app called Alfred. And what generally is the Alfred app? So if you have uh, two different cell phones, um, you can set one up as a camera and you can set one up as a receiver. And these were plans that the defendant was telling you that he was going to do once he left you? Yes. You talked about uh, when you saw the defendant that morning, uh, he was acting weird. You discussed some of your observations of him. What else do you remember about the defendant's demeanor when he was talking about his plans to go back to the house and to set up cameras to check up on the two women? I don't understand the question. Like, yep. The question is, what else do you remember about the defendant's demeanor, behavior, when he was talking about his plans to return to the Just house? the same behavior that was before we discussed. Do you remember anything else? Not that I can recall. And would reviewing a transcript of your former testimony possibly jog your memory as to that aspect? Yes. Line 24, so I'll ask you to start at line 24. Okay. Read through the rest of the other page. Uh, to about line 10 on 577. Okay. Same rules as before. Read as much as you want before then. After then, when you're done reading, look up so I know. Okay.
Does that jog or refresh your memory as to any other aspects of the defendant's demeanor that early Friday morning? It does. How else was the defendant? Uh, aggressive. And he was acting aggressive while talking about his plans to return to the house to set up those cameras to check on the two women? Correct. And at some point after he discusses those plans with you, with you, does he, the defendant, actually leave your house? He does. And where was he going based on his conversations with you? Uh, to the Meadowboro house. And what about you? Where do you go? Nowhere. So you stay at your house? I do. Moving ahead later that same morning of January 27th, did you see the defendant again at your house later that morning? Yes. I don't, I don't recall if it was morning or afternoon. And that was going to be my next question. Yep. About when was it? About. A around noon. Who else was at your house at the time when the defendant returned later that Friday? Uh, Cassie and Ian. And Cassie being your girlfriend at the time and Ian being a friend at the time? Yes. What do you remember about your encounter with the defendant later on Friday, January 27th? And let's begin with where you were when you first saw the defendant. Where were you? I was outside on my porch. Were you expecting the defendant later that morning? I was not. Now, that being said, did the two of you, uh, you and Mr. Verrill, have that kind of friendship where one could just stop by at the other's house and just hang out? Yes. But that morning, the, the two of you did not make plans to meet that morning? No, we did not. Had you had any communication with the defendant by any means since your face-to-face -face conversation with him earlier that Friday morning when he expressed concern that an informant was at the house in Meterboro Road and left pl with plans to set up cameras to check on the two women at the house? I had not. <clears throat> Later on the 27th, uh, how did the defendant arrive at your house? By, by what vehicle? Uh, the, the SUV, the CRV. And was the defendant alone when he arrived at your house in his car? He was. And what do you remember about what the defendant was wearing when you saw him at your house later on January 27th? He was wearing a t-shirt and I don't remember what his pants were. Looking at still photos, this is State's Exhibit 30W. Uh, first, you recognize the person depicted in these stills? I do. When you saw the defendant at your house later on January 27th, he was not wearing a long sleeve shirt like seen in these photos, but a, but a t-shirt? He was. And with respect to the defendant wearing a t-shirt, what do you remember generally about the temperature outside that Friday morning when you saw the defendant? It was really cold. Uh, also looking at these photos, Mr. Caldwell, uh, the defendant appears to be wearing a hat. Do you remember whether or not the defendant was wearing a hat when you saw him that Friday? I don't recall. Fair enough. Uh, that being said, the hat that the defendant is wearing in these photos, does that hat look familiar to you? It does. And, and how so? Um, it's one of the hats that, uh, we, uh, that he would wear. It's, uh, we got a sleeve of these hats. Um, and he would take the hat out of that and he would draw on them and wear them. And uh, what, what color hat would that be? White. So what do you remember happening when the defendant pulled into your driveway later on January 27th? He's alone in his car, he's dressed in a t-shirt, although it's freezing him. What, what do you remember happening? Him coming into my house. Um, Asking me for a pair of pants. Do you remember the defendant saying anything to you as he walks into your house? Something like interesting night. That's the defendant saying words to the effect of interesting night as he's walking into your house? To that effect. Uh, when the defendant walked into your house, did you see him with uh, Cassie, your girlfriend at the time? Yes. Soon after the defendant had some interactions with Cassie, did Cassie leave the house? She left, yes. Remember what she was doing at the time? I think she was going to the gym. I, I don't recall. Uh, what do you remember happening after Cassie leaves the house? We went into the house. 
And when you say we went into the house, that's the defendant and you? Yes. And I believe you testified before about some pants? Yes. What, what about the pants? He asked me for a pair of pants. The defendant asked you for a pair of pants? Correct. Was he wearing pants at the time? He was. So uh, he asked you for a pair of pants after saying interesting night. What do you do? I went and got him a pair of pants. And what's he do? Uh, he headed down in my basement. Does he do anything with the pants? Yeah, I, I give him the pants and he uh, takes off his pants and puts those ones on. Do you remember what happened to the pants that he was wearing? Um, they were just sitting on the floor. Do you notice anything about the defendant uh, when you were interacting with him uh, smell-wise? Yeah, he, he, uh, he smelled like B.O. Did you ask the defendant why he wanted to borrow a pair of pants and why he was changing into a new pair of pants? I didn't. Why not? I just didn't. Was that strange? I'm, um, I don't know. Like I, I, if any of my friends ask me for clothes, I'm going to give them clothes. And, but it's reciprocating, right? If I needed, if I needed a hoodie, somebody would give me a hoodie. What else do you remember happening inside the house after you get the defendant a pair of pants and he switches pair of pants? Um, I remember him taking a couple shots of Jameson. He was smoking a joint. And just, yeah, just acting strange. And what do you mean by acting strange? He just was... Uh, Just acting weird. I, I don't know. I know it's maybe difficult for you to put it into words. You talked before about the early morning uh, Friday, January 27th encounter that you had with him and tried to describe his demeanor, how it seemed stranger than you'd ever seen him before. Was it similar later in the morning? Yeah. Were you talking with the defendant while inside your house? I was. What do you remember about conversations that you had with him? Just... I don't remember the specifics of the conversation. I just remember saying to him, man, if, like, if you did something up there, uh, you know, Dean's going to be pissed. And then he, like, looked at me and he said, really? And uh, that's when I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm out. And I just walked outside. And what do you mean at that point, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out? Like, I don't want part of this conversation. Why? Because I, I didn't know and I didn't want to be implicated. How are you feeling at this point? Uncomfortable. Soon after you left the defendant inside in your house, did he join you outside? Yes. And what do you remember happening outside? He just, I, I, I believe he gave me a hug and he just said, uh, and then he left. And he said, uh, I got to go tie up some loose ends. Uh, defendant Mr. Barrell said words to the effect that he needed to tie up loose ends? Correct. Did you ask him what he meant by that? No. Again, was that a question that you wanted to ask at the time? No. Uh, what about the pants? Do you, were the pants still there? No. The pants that he taken No, off? he grabbed the pants and took off with them. Did the defendant leave in his car saying after he said he needed to tie up loose ends? Yes. Did you ever speak to the defendant again after he left that morning wearing a t-shirt, a new pair of pants, and saying that he needed to tie up loose ends? No. Was that the last time when you saw the defendant outside of court appearances? Yes. So you just recounted interactions that you had with the defendant that morning of the January 27th. Again, how did you feel about those interactions? Uncomfortable. Did Is you it? do anything at the time, such as check out the house, call the police? Um, no, I didn't call the police. I, I got a hold of Dean. What about check the house out? So I, I yeah. So I drove not inside. I drove by the house. Um, at one point, because I saw I went to the hardware store. 
uh, and I saw. So, so Mr. Cole, let me cut you off yeah. there because we will get to that. Okay. But I mean, when the defendant is at your house, he's wearing only a T-shirt, even though it's freezing out. He's yeah. smelling a body odor. He asks for a pair of pants. Swaps into a new pair of pants. Talks about how he had an interesting night, and then says he needs to go tie up loose ends. At that point, why didn't you call the police? Why didn't you check out the house? Um. To be completely honest, because I I didn't um, I didn't want to call the police. I was selling drugs and I was in a motorcycle club. Um, if I just I didn't call the police, right? I um, and you didn't want to get involved. Yeah, that's a failure on your part, right? How do you feel about that now? Horrible. What did you do at your house after the defendant left, talking about having to tie up some loose ends? You need to take a break? Can I? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, just five minutes. All right, folks, we'll just retire to the uh, deliberation room. You don't need to go all the way back to the assembly room. We'll be back in five minutes.
All right, you may resume. So, Mr. Call, if you recall one of the many text messages before uh, the lunch break, there was a text message in which you were discussing you had uh, a damaged door that you needed to repair. Do you recall that? I do. After the defendant left uh, that late morning, uh, around noontime, January 27th, did you return to that chore of fixing or trying to fix the door? I did. At some point during that chore, did you leave the house? I did. And for what purpose? To grab a hinge. Grab a hinge? A hinge. And uh, where did you go generally to get that? Uh, Home Depot. And uh, who did you see as you drove to the Home Depot? I uh, saw Tim driving past us. And as the defendant was driving past you, would that be towards or away from Meterboro Road that he was driving? He was driving towards. After you went to Home Depot, where did you go? I, uh, I went home. Did you stop by or drive by the Meterboro Road house first? I did. And did you actually drive into the house or just drive by? I just drove by. And what did you see outside the house as you drove by? I saw uh, Tim's car parked there. Why did you drive to the house and not enter the driveway to see what was going on with the defendant? Again, didn't want anything to More do with the it. same before we took a break? Yes. Uh, where did you go after you drove by the Meterboro Road house and saw the defendant's car parked there? Back to my house. Uh, ultimately, uh, did you attempt to contact Dean Smronk? I did. So let's return to the cell phone communications chart, States Exhibit 17. We're now on to communications on the afternoon of Friday, January 27th, between you and Dean Smronk. Let me read them and I'll have some follow up questions. The first two are text messages you to Dean Smronk. Join me on Confide so we can chat confidentially with encrypted and disappearing messages. And then it has a web address. Need to speak soon. These text messages begin at 3.30 p.m. And then Dean Smronk has an auto reply from his cell phone. And then you follow up with a text message at 3.52 p.m. Very soon, bro. Uh, if you can explain that first text message that you sent, That's the a, confide in the web address. Yeah, it's an app. And again, what is the confide app? It's a, an app where um, you read the text messages, it's encrypted, and then you gotta scroll on it to be able to read it, um, and then, um, and then it, the message disappears. Why did you want to communicate with Dean Smronk on Confide rather than regular cell phone text messages or calls like the many that you had exchanged with Dean Smronk up to that point that we reviewed? In all honesty, I, I didn't want to get pulled into something like this. And I really just wasn't thinking. About 38 minutes after you sent that confide invitation, you followed up with the text message, need to speak soon, and then a couple minutes later, very soon. What did you want to speak to Dean Smronk about? What was so urgent to you? Um, talking about uh, Tim and all of that. And all that being, do you know what happened at the house? I don't. Ask. No, the, the question wasn't leading. You can go ahead. <clears throat> the last text was sent at 3.52 p.m. The next series begins about a half an hour later. Dean Smronk to you, do I have a couple minutes? Then you to Dean, yes, but please on confide. Dean Smronk to you, how bad is the news? You to Dean Smronk, 10, and then Dean Smronk to you, boy. Whoops, excuse me. Your response to Dean Smronk's inquiry about how bad the news was, 10. What did you mean by 10? Just, I need to talk to you now. Like, I, it's an urgent matter. What was the news that you planned to share with Dean Smronk? That I think that Tim did something stupid up at the house. And what was that based on? That you Just believe? the way he was acting. The way that the defendant, Tim Vero, was acting? Yes. So that last text message was sent by Dean Smronk to you at 4.22 p.m. 
going on to additional communications. We have first two attempted calls, Dean Smronk to you, and then we have you a text message to Dean Smronk, I don't want to talk over the phone, bro, and then a text message, Dean Smronk to you. Dean Smronk just sent you a confidential message with confide, view your message here, and then it has a web address. As to the first two entries on the screen, Dean Smronk's cell phone uh, tries to contact your cell phone. Do you remember, did you pick up the calls? I don't remember. And you do send a text message, I don't want to talk over the phone, bro. Based on that text message, would you have picked up calls? Probably not. And why not? Because I, I thought that uh, the calls could be recorded um, and then could be used in court. Uh, soon after you say, in substance, you don't want to talk over the phone, and Dean Smronk gives you a confidential message invite, do you have a text conversation with Dean Smronk using Confide? I do. And what, if anything, do you remember about that conversation by text message with Dean Smronk? Just telling him to get up here. He needed to get up here uh, and check in on his house. That same day, January 27th, did you see the defendant again after that encounter at your house where he borrowed a pair of your pants, uh, was wearing a t-shirt, smelling a body odor, and left saying that he needed to tie up loose ends? Did you see the defendant again that day? On that day, no. Did you have any communication with the defendant after that by call or by text message? No. Do you remember having any further communications with Dean Smaronk that day after the confide communications between him and you? If you remember. I don't remember. Let's go to Saturday, January 28th. Did you see Mr. Verrill, the defendant, that day? I did not. Did you have any contacts with the defendant that day? I did not. Going on to a series of cell phone communications between you and Dean Smaronk on that Saturday. They begin at 11.35 p.m., Dean Smaronk to you. It's a forwarded text message, Tim's new number. And then you have a call to Dean Smaronk, which lasts about 23 seconds. The last three text messages, again, are different conversants, so I'm not going to ask you about those. As to the first text message, you being forwarded Tim's new number, that was a reference to the defendant? Correct. Had you known that the defendant had changed his cell phone number from the one that he had used with you just the day before in those many text message conversations that we went over? I did not. Had the defendant had any communication with you beforehand indicating that he was changing his cell phone number, getting a new phone? No. The last text message from, uh, I'm sorry, this last one is between the two of you. Yep. The last text message, Dean Smaronk to you, and I believe that's 11.59 p.m. on Saturday, January 28th. I'll be right, I'll be right there. What's that a reference to? Uh, picking him up at the airport. And had you arranged with Dean Smaronk to pick him up at the airport? I did. And uh, what airport would that be? Logan. And about when did you pick Dean Smaronk up at the airport? About? Around midnight. And when you picked Dean Smaronk up at the airport in Boston at around midnight, were you with anyone? I was. And who were you with? I was with Cassie. Where did the three of you uh, go? You, Cassie, and Dean Smaronk after you pick up Dean Smaronk at the airport? Back to my house. Uh, given Cassie's presence in the vehicle, were you talking to Dean Smaronk about your concerns about the defendant and the women at Meterboro Road? No. Why not? Because he just didn't talk around women about stuff, and I didn't know if she'd go talk to the cops. That sounds horrible, I know, but. And again, where did the three of you go initially from the airport? To my house, our house, Cassie and I's. Uh, do you pick up anything when you go to the house? I do. And what do you pick up? Uh, my firearm. And why did you pick up your firearm? Because I didn't know what I was going to be walking into at the house. And when you say, I didn't know what I was walking into at the house, that's the Meterboro Road? Correct. Had you and Dean planned to go to Meterboro Road after dropping off Cassie? Correct. Uh, about how long of a car ride is it 
from 54 Central Street, where you and Cassie were living, to the Meterboro Road residence? About? Five, ten minutes. About what time do you and Dean Smrunk get to the Meterboro Road residence? About? One-ish, maybe a little bit later. And this would be on Sunday, January 29th, right? That is correct. And what do you remember happening when you and Dean arrive at the house? I remember we pulling up to the house. I parked the truck. Um, we went into the house. Um, and he had, when I got in, he went in first. I went in behind him. And then uh, he was standing at like a panel. I remember that. And he was saying something about. Well, can't go into what he was saying, but what was he looking at? He was looking at a panel. Okay. Uh, with respect to how you and Dean Smronk entered the house, is it the door that we've seen before? It is. Uh, looking at a photo from State's Exhibit 32A, the jurors are going to see more of this from another witness. That morning, did you go out into that enclosed three-season porch that I'm indicating with the laser pointer? Did I what? Do you recall if you went out to this area when I did you not. went to the house that morning? Uh, to the right, as one looks off to the right, there's a, an, a detached garage. Is that accurate? That is correct. Did you notice anything different about that garage when you got there that early Sunday morning? I did. And what did you notice different about the garage? That uh, the windows in the garage were spray painted. From your pre previous times at the address, had the garage windows ever been painted over? No. When you and Dean Schmaronk initially were inside the house, were the lights working? If you remember. Downstairs, yes. Upstairs, no. Uh, does Dean Schmaronk do anything with respect to the lights that weren't up working upstairs? Yeah, he ran back downstairs and flipped the, the panel. So at least part of the power was turned off. You talked before the lunch break about there were surveillance cameras at the house. Yeah. Uh, was the surveillance system working? I don't know. Turning to some other still photos, States Exhibit 30Z. And you've seen the clip from which these videos were taken? I have. And who is the person in blue or purple? That's uh, uh, Dean. About how long were you at the house on Meterboro Road with Dean Smronk before you left that early Sunday morning? Uh, About 15, 15 minutes. When you left the house, did Dean Smronk leave with you? No. When you left the house, did Dean Smronk give you anything to take with you? He did. And what did you take with you that was given to you by Dean Smronk? Drugs. And when we talk about drugs, what are we talking about? What did Dean Strong give you that you remember? Cocaine, methamphetamine. And why did Dean Strong give you these drugs to take from the house? Because he was going to call the cops. Uh, let's go to why the police were being called out to the house. So you and Dean Strong arrive, you enter the house, uh, power is turned on to the entire house. What happened inside the house once the power had been turned on? We, well, we were searching the house, looking around, um, and he had walked into uh, a bedroom, and he, um, he, I heard him say, oh, shit, or something along those lines. And uh, when I, so I looked, and... Um, before we get to what you saw in the bedroom, do you remember anything about the carpeting upstairs? I remember uh, it looked like it was just cleaned. Like, I, I believe what it was. Yeah, I, I, I recall thinking that it was just cleaned. Uh, you heard Dean say something around the world. Uh, we're around the something like oh shit or something like that oh yeah oh sh yeah and that was in the upstairs bedroom that was so states exhibit 32n did you look inside the bedroom i did and 
I need you to look. Is this what you saw, blood on a bare mattress? Yes. What was your reaction, Mr. Caldwell, to seeing the blood on the bed? In reality, scared. And what did you do at that point? I told Dean to call the cops and I was getting out of there. And again, why did you leave the house after seeing this bloody mattress? Because I didn't want to be there when the cops showed up. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Cross-examination? Yes, sir. Can I ask for a two-minute break? <coughs> Right, folks, uh, once again, just go into the uh, assembly room, uh, no, the deliberation room right here. We'll be back in about two or three minutes.
can bring in the juror. So like the, uh, the state said at the beginning of your testimony, um, it's been about seven years since this happened. Um, and uh, you've given quite a few statements between then and now, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of time has passed, right? Um, and as you said on direct, there might be uh, things that you forget. You might need your memory refreshed from time right. to time. Um, this is also not uh, your first time testifying under oath about these murders. Correct. Um, you've done it twice before, actually. Twice before? There was once there was a grand jury that you testified. Oh, okay, in yes. Of, right? And you're under oath there, too. Correct. A little bit of a different setting, right? There was no defense yeah. attorneys there. Correct. Uh, and then, of course, at the prior trial. Correct. Uh, and there are other times that you um, spoke to the police as, during, the, during the investigation. Correct. Um, the judge and uh, the state reviewed with you also at the beginning um, your immunity letter. Correct. Correct. Um, and that immunity letter and the immunity protections were in place at the time of the last trial, correct? Correct. And you've since resolved that case, as the state said, in federal court? Correct. Um, and those were uh, two convictions involving the sale of methamphetamine? Correct. Um, and the uh, date of those offenses were in November of 2017? No, I don't think so. If I showed you a document from your court case, would that refresh yeah, your recollection? Please. May I approach your honor? Yes. It says 2017. Okay. And for the record, this is a document from the U.S. District Court uh, listing the charges in the Correct. Can you plead a guilty to those charges around 2019? Or, excuse me, 2021? Can I see that again, please? I don't think it was 2017. I, re I know it says 2017, but I, I don't, it was 2018, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Do you think that you were arrested in 2018? Yeah, I, yes, I was, yeah. Okay. And you picked guilty in 2021? I did.
your sentence entailed one day in jail? Less than. And one year of probation? Um, it was called uh, supervised, supervised release. release. Now, in regards to this investigation, uh, throughout the course of this, from during any time, uh, the police never took DNA samples from you? Correct. Uh, they never took your fingerprints? Correct. They never took palm prints? Correct. Uh, they never took your phone? Correct. And I think at this time you actually had two phones. I believe so. Um, but regardless, they never took any, they didn't take any of your phones? Correct. Um, they never even looked at them. Yeah, I don't think so. They never searched uh, your apartment or your home? They did not. Um, they never searched your car? They did not. And they never executed a body warrant, which is, they didn't take any pictures of your body? Correct. Um, and overall, just didn't do any any searches of your property or or your body. Not that I can recall. I think it's uh, been well established already that uh, you have a background involving drug abuse, right? Drug use, yes. Um, and you've been sober for how many years now? Um, years five. It's a long time. Yep. You should you should be proud of yourself. Thank you. Um, and you're now working with people in the recovery community? I am. Um, fair to say you're a much different person than you were before. Fair. Um, and in this community, you've, you've found um, a sense of belonging or a sense of community? I would say, yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned that you met Tim a while back through um, mutual friends, or was that how you reconnected? Both. Okay. When did you meet the first time? Where? When? Oh, I, I don't recall. Okay. Do you have a, do you have a date range? <laughs> I don't. Okay. Um, and you said you reconnected maybe in late summer, early fall of 2016? I don't know if it was 2016. Yes, yes, 2016, yes. Sorry. <laughs> like we said, it's that been paper a paper threw me off, to be it's honest. It's been a while, okay. <laughs> you can put that paper behind you. Um, you always knew Tim is kind of a nerd. You, yeah, I mean, in the kindest way possible. Right, okay. Um, right, I think you've also said that he's uh, someone who is always smiling. I have. Um, you knew him as someone who wasn't violent? Yes. Um, he wasn't really an aggressive person? What was that? He wasn't really an aggressive person. Right. Um, and uh, you knew him to be kind and gentle? Correct. You also knew that Tim didn't really, or ha did not have any issues with Christine. Do I think, what was that? Tim, Tim didn't have any animosity toward Christine. He did. Now, you met Tim, or excuse me, you met Christine and Dean through Tim, right? Correct. And uh, uh, that was in the fall of 2016? Yes, it's somewhere around there. Okay. Um, and you initially started working for Dean as his debt collector? Correct. And you knew that by bringing you into the fold, Tim earned a commission from Dean? I, I, no, I didn't. What do or, you mean? Not aware of that? That he earned a commission? Yeah. I knew, like, I, I didn't know what their agreement was, if that's what. Okay. Yeah. 
So you're saying you, you did not know, you do not know that, that he earned a commission for bringing you into the fold? I did not. I, I, don't, I don't recall that. Okay, that, that's fine. If yeah. you don't recall, that's... <laughs> that's uh, but you testified on direct that you started working for Dean uh, as a uh, debt collector, right? I did. Um, and you testified that you did that uh, a few times. I did. That you, act in that, you acted in that role. I did. Um, and a few times met uh, more than once. Correct. Uh, I think on direct it said, uh, or the state said, uh, gave the number 10 and you said below 10. Yes. So somewhere between one and nine times you acted as an enforcer. Yeah, between one and nine, yeah. Okay. Now, as we established, you testified previously under oath, correct? Correct. At a prior trial. And at that time you had uh, the same coverage of immunity as you have this time? I believe so, yeah. You were sworn in the same way? Yes. As you were last time? Uh, also in front of a jury? Correct. Directing you to a transcript of your testimony. There's a question starting there. Did you ever actually do that, meaning ever actually assist Mr. Smorok in helping collect drug debts? And you said no. Correct? I, I said that, but I must have misheard. I've never intentionally lied. Like I didn't, so I guess the best way well, to explain, uh, can I explain that? I, I'm going to go further into the, the transcript because that might Okay, uh, I, I think I, I know why I said no. Okay. Um, I'll begin at, at the, uh, about two, two questions before that. Um, is that why Tim introduced you to Dean? He introduced me because Dean was looking for help to collect money for people that owed him debt for drugs. Okay, and Dean or the defendant thought you could be Somebody to help with that I said that's correct. And that's something you agreed to do. That is. Did you actually ever do that? This is the part we just read. Yep. Did you ever actually do that? Meaning ever actually assist Mr. Smrog in helping collect drug debts? And you say no. Did you ever actually have a conversation with him, uh, with anybody about collecting on a debt along with Mr. Smrog? Uh, and you say yes. Yes. And then that goes into a, a time in which you joined Dean. Uh, in Florida, yes, in that role. So what I was saying before, I, I'm sorry, I haven't asked a question yet. When you went down to Florida, you were acting in the role of a of a debt collector for Dean. Correct. And on that trip, you actually acted in that role. I did. And at the last trial, you denied acting in that role on that trip. That, that's taken out of context. I said afterwards that I did. What I was saying before was I had never actually collected any money. I can see your computer. Oh. <laughs> yep.
I want to make sure that I get this part right, which is why I'm taking some time. So I appreciate your patience. All right, so you just testified that um, you actually weren't involved in the taking of the money. Is that what you were saying? No. What I was saying is I don't remember ever a time where I actually collected the money. Like, I went there to collect the money, but no transaction was ever made. Like, money... I don't remember a time where money was ever handed over. And you're saying that's what happened that time in Florida? I don't remember. You don't remember? What? You don't remember any money being exchanged or? I don't remember. Okay. Uh, so it's possible money was exchanged? I, I don't think there was. I, I don't remember. Okay. And this happened more than once, up to nine times? No, not a... Can you repeat the question? Did you act in that role between one and nine times? I believe so, yes. And the last time you said you never actually assisted Dean in collecting drug money. I said I don't remember ever really getting, I don't remember ever getting money. I don't recall. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. It's still five percent. Yeah, just to be clear, these are these are not my words. Did you ever actually do that? Meaning, ever actually assist Mr. Smrock in helping to collect drug debts? And you say no. But the question after that: Did you ever have a conversation with him about collecting on debt with Mr. Smrock? And you say yes. Okay, so I. So I misspoke. It was not an intentional lie, I promise. And you certainly said nothing about doing it a few times or up to nine times. What do you mean? There was no mention in your prior testimony about acting in that role more than one time or up to nine times. And before or today? Before, when you were under oath at the last trial, I, I don't remember. And the time you went down there, that was in November of 2017. Down where? When you went down to Florida in that role. I don't recall. Okay. But you remember that it was just you and, De you and Dean at that time? I don't recall. Okay. There was a second time that you went down to Florida, right? Correct. Um, that was in December? I don't recall when it was. Okay. But it was after the time you went down with you? Yes. Okay. Uh, that time was different. That time was a vacation. Correct. Okay. Uh, your girlfriend was invited that time? Yes. Um, and uh, Christine was also down there? Correct. Uh, so the four of you um, hung out together? Correct. Where did you guys stay on that trip? Uh, in their house, down there. <laughs> now, you testified a little bit to this on direct that um, you started to fill in uh, when Tim was missing delivery appointments. I did. Right. Um, so you were 
started to take over some of his customers. No, not some of them. One of them. One of them. Um, and that was the one customer who we heard the text messages between you two. Correct. Uh, and he reached directly out to you. Who reached out directly to me? That, that individual. Yes. I believe you called him Kurt. I believe you called him Kurt. No, that, that's a whole different situation. Okay, that's a different situation. Yeah. We will get to that. Was this person's name Rob? Yes. So Rob reached out to you saying that Tim had missed an appointment. Yes. Rob was not happy about that. He was upset, yes. Um, and uh, you were going to solve the problem. I was well, gonna... let me just say it this way. You reached out to Tim about it. Reach out to who about to it? To Tim. Yes. Um, and you also reported the issue to Dean. Yes. Uh, and you told Rob that you would handle it. Yes. Now, we also heard on uh, direct that you wouldn't really deal with Christine that much. Correct. And in fact, the only communication we have for late January, from the 21st to the 29th, what we saw on the screen, is the one time you tried to reach Christine when you were at the bank and inadvertently reached Jenna instead. What we saw, yeah. There are no other communications between you two. With her and I? Correct. Before? On that, but the exhibit that we have that is for your knowledge, entered as a full exhibit. It's, for, it's what I can recall. Okay. You said you didn't really have uh, the type of relationship where um, you two would communicate directly over the phone? Or I mean, we, the phone? we talked over the phone sometimes, yeah. Okay. So on direct, when you said you didn't really have that type of relationship where you'd be in contact through the phone, is that not totally correct? I, I don't know, like, we, we didn't talk as often as, like, Dean and I, and Tim and I. So your relationship didn't involve one where you would text each other occasionally or call each other occasionally? Yeah, occasionally, yeah. Now, when you were concerned about Christine, the weekend of the murders, you didn't text her? No. You didn't call her? Not that I can recall. text messages in here. Not all of them involve you. Yeah. Um, but it, yours are designated with JC, as we saw on the screen. Okay. These also reflect phone calls. These are, this is a full record. Okay. I'm going to ask you to, <clears throat> this is the beginning of Friday, January 27th. Okay. I will orient you toward um, uh, the beginning of the early morning, mm -hmm. or I'll say mid-morning. And we'll find the first one where let's start at 10. Let's start here. 1236 in the morning. Mm -hmm. That's a text message from you to Tim. Mm -hmm. Friday, January 27th. Now, can you flip through this uh, until you reached um, late Saturday? And look for your name and see if there's any corresponding message to Christine. Phone call.
All right, Council, it's 4 o'clock. We're going to uh, suspend for the day. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll return tomorrow morning to begin at uh, 10 a.m. Um, just it's the best you can. Try to be here a few minutes before 10 o'clock, and we'll try to start on time. All right, thank you. Please leave your notebooks right. behind. Jerry, Down, and we're going to start again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.